Before the soul can see, the harmony within must first be attained, and the fleshly eyes be rendered blind to all illusion, as you step beyond the veil. initiation you know to a lot of people it can mean entering a secret society however true initiation is an inward journey it's a spiritual path that is totally inward it has nothing to do with anything external to you the initiatory path is one of self-discovery and self-revealing it's not a it's not a journey that someone can hold your hand through and it's not a journey that someone can walk you through e either it is something that you have to go for for yourself uh, it's kind of the same as addictions or dependencies or things that you have to deal with yourself and get out of yourself I've, I've actually received a, a private message from somebody earlier this week saying that their family was uh, involuntarily institutionalizing them on her father's birthday. And, you know, I, I had to ask the question, is this the right thing for you? And she said, you know, I really don't think it is, but I don't feel like I can take care of myself right now. And I told her it, it, the, the key here is that you need to know what you need and you don't need to have other people tell you what you need because deep down inside we all know what we actually need and we all know what we want that's the surface layer of things but what we actually need is usually not what other people think that we need and you know i counseled her a little bit and she you know i i think she's in a better place now but the point being all of these journeys are completely inward and they're completely uh, individual. It has nothing to do with anything outside of you. But once you realize that, then the initiatory journey becomes much more colorful and much more about you instead of about a group or groupthink. That's even more dangerous when you get into what you feel is an initi initiation or an initiatory journey, but it actually is something else. It's something that is seeking to either put your light out completely or stifle it or better yet, what and what the AI usually does is twist and mold your gifts into something that it can use to further itself, to keep itself going. It will hijack your creativity and turn it to its own ends. It'll hijack your drive and your love for humanity and turn it to other ends. And so that's, that's initiation to me. It's totally inward and it's completely independent. No, I completely agree with you. Um, I found myself to be initiated but it was through the plants it was through the raw consciousness it was going inward it was through the self it wasn't through some external entity book gnosis etc etc now i would say that it's worth noting what is inside of these ancient books philosophies especially the ones that are demonized that's why i'm so interested in freemasonry because it's been demonized so heavily in the conspiracy circles that um if you want to cover something up or you want to suppress something that's a better way to put it then you demonize it you don't go knocking on people's doors and present the book to literally everybody that's the deception that's the lie that's why i'm like anti-religion because i understand that if somebody is throwing something in my face it's not going to be the truth the truth doesn't come in your face the truth is hidden on purpose there are forces that want to hide the truth and so they bury the truth and so it's our responsibility as truth seekers to go deep and to start unraveling these mysteries and ultimately unraveling the mysteries from within ourselves. But um, because there's been a, so much of a push 
um, to demonize a lot of this ancient wisdom and knowledge. And I theorize that it goes back to the Egyptian mystery schools. I mean, I think Freemasonry is nothing more than um, the continuation of the mystery schools, which the same religious institutions that have been demonizing Masonry, Egypt, uh, Egyptology, um, spirituality. I heard a term the other day. And the reason that it stuck out is because it had my name in it, Geomancy. And I didn't really quite understand what it was. And I asked Cherie, what's, what's Geomancy? I thought it had to do with some kind of, I don't know, death ritual or something like that. And she said, oh, well, that's when you take energy from the earth and you use it. And I'm like, that's bad? <laughs> All of a sudden, why this is bad? Why is this bad? So, um, yeah, up is down, left is right, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's what we're going to get to the bottom of tonight. I think a lot of things are like that, where the more the more crap people talk about it, the the better it is and the more awesome it is. I've noticed that, um, especially when you come to things like religion and things like that, it's often the things that they say are the worst things ever that actually have the greatest truths to unfold. And it's it's almost as if that that first layer of scariness is there on purpose to keep people that aren't ready for that kind of information completely away from it. And then only those that are ready for it actually proceed. Yes. I do want to take a moment to kind of flip the topic here and talk about something that, you know, I, I want to get back into the raw consciousness stuff. I want to get back into unlocking the mysteries of the AI, and uh, we will do that in the next couple of days. We'll do a special broadcast for everybody um, sometime during the week because it has been a little while since we have been able to get on air. But one of the reasons is a lot of people around us have had a lot of turmoil and things that they've been dealing with. And um, today... Um, over the well, over the course of the last couple of weeks, there's been a situation with our dear friend Lucky, and um, she has been a friend of ours for about 14 years now. We we've known her since what 2007, 2006, yeah, yeah, 2006, something like that, maybe 15 years. Uh, I mean, it's 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 been well, no, what's 2006? That's 10 years, 11 about years, 10, 11 years, okay, 11, yeah, yeah 11, 11 years, um, but a long time. We've known her from way before on the prison planet forum, before Sheree and I even got together. And um, she's a huge, huge, huge contributor to TFR. She hosts a show twice a week. Um, she also does a lot of stuff in the background that a lot of people don't realize. But she'll just, like, by herself, just do promos for all the hosts. And she's constantly helping the host with technical problems and so on and so forth. It's been a huge, 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 huge help for me. So anytime anybody messes with Lucky... Or anytime Lucky has some problems or some issues, we as good friends always try to step in and try to help. Or we, we, you know, we, we're, we're the type, we always stand for our friends. So she was getting attacked really heavily a couple of months ago by a group of trolls. And I told all of them, hey, go screw yourself. And that's it. That's where kind of where hashtag go fuck yourself came from because they were messing with my friends. Do not fuck with my friends, especially my lifelong friends like this. Um, but just recently, she decided to move out to somebody's home that had a ranch and um the agreement was hey you know why don't you come out here i need some help i've got all this space here uh, i want to fix the house up i want to do this i want to do that etc so come on out here and uh you can stay here with me you can do your radio show just help me out around the house and that's that so she gets there and expends all of her resources to get there once she gets there, everything's okay for a couple days, but then there were a bunch of red flags that started to develop uh, after that started to spring up afterwards. And then the story changed to, okay, now you need to work 10 hours a day um, on the farm. And she's like, well, you know, that's that's a lot just to exchange just for rent. Oh, no, 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 no. You also need to pay $500 a month in rent. No, no, no. First, hold on. Let me back up. First, it was the electric bill. And that's it. And then it changed to $500 a month rent. And then it changed to $1,000 a month rent, plus working on the farm from sundown to sunup. No, sunup sun up to, to sun. Yeah, yeah. sunup to sundown. And um, she's like, hey, this is impossible. I can't I can't do this. I didn't agree to this, et cetera, et cetera. But she had expended all of her resources and um, there was nothing that she could do. So she tried to help out on the farm as much as she could. But she's 51 years old and she's not, you know, an 18 year old kid that can go out there and work for 10 hours in the blazing sun. 
So the guy started to get upset and there were more, you know, red flags that started to pop up, which included him cutting off the internet access for her. He would give her like a couple of hours of internet a day. Mm -hmm. And then it, it got to the point where it was being cut off completely. Um, and then he cut off the, the landline and he cut off all communication to the outside world. And I was speaking to her. And um, it was like five o'clock in the morning, literally. I saw her online. Hey, are you up? Yeah, I just got up. Boom, internet's turned off. And she calls me from the landline. And she says, hey, you know, this has been going on for a while. This is a problem. And I need to get out of here. I don't know how to get out of here, et cetera, et cetera. Boom, phone line goes dead. Well, it doesn't go dead, but the, the line the line is literally pulled. Gets pulled. Yeah, literally, the line, the, the house line gets pulled from her phone. And this other guy's on the phone and he's cussing me out. And he's like, she needs to do what I say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she needs to put $250 per week in my PayPal account and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't have somebody working 10 hours a day on the farm and not pay them. So you need to pay her for all the work that she's done up to this point. Then we'll talk about the rest later. We had a little bit of a back and forth. And what he did was... Um, he um he, he he was yelling at me on the phone and he says fine she's out of here slam and at that point i said holy shit there's something seriously wrong and she's been kind of like trying to hint at this but she really can't talk when this guy's around because um uh he, he, i mean he's like monitoring everything he's keeping her from being able to call her friends call out um etc cetera, etc cetera. so i called the sheriff and I said, hey, um, you need to get somebody over there. They're like, oh, well, you know exactly what house this is. And we've got somebody there immediately. They sent somebody quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, like lightning fast. Because there have been um, uh, a series of reports there. And the dispatcher calls me, calls me back and she's like, hey, look, um, you need to get your friend out of there any way you can. Because there's been a consistent problem here. Uh, similar problems, problems with neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. They knew exactly who this dude was. And this dude was like, you know, acting like the nicest guy in the world, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. until she got down there. So um, for the first time, I went ahead and put up a GoFundMe. I mean, 10 years of broadcasting. We've never done this before. Never asked for money, um, anything like that. I mean, we do have the TFR supporter pass, and that's how we've been funding the station. And so we, we give. We don't just ask, hey, just give us, just give us. It's like, you know, it's an even exchange. Like, hey, we've got high-quality downloads. We've got this. We've got that, et cetera, et cetera, for you. Um, and you, in turn, support the station, and it's been working out really well. But so many of you stepped up to the plate for Lucky. And I'm just like absolutely amazed at how this has worked out. We're trying to raise a few thousand dollars for her so she can get the hell, she can get a truck, she can get the hell out of there, she can relocate, she can find somewhere to settle down and, um, you know, kind of start a new life. She thought that this was going to be a great opportunity, beautiful <laughs> farm, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it turned into an absolute nightmare. So. We have, um, let's see, where's the screen? There we go. So we've been raising a little bit of money for her at GoFundMe.com slash Lucky. And Lucky is spelled with two E's. And I want to take a moment to thank everybody that has donated. Um, Justin, who is Naga Ward in the chat $50 donation, $20 anonymous. Mike Quinn, who is not even a TFR listener. He's just a listener of our show personally. I don't think he's ever listened to Lucky ever. Aww. Chipped in, chipped in 50 bucks. Steve Jimenez, good friend, longtime listener, et cetera, et cetera. $100 from anonymous, $100 from Frank Castle, uh, $200 from Nick Zervos, Progeny of Light Aww. in the chat room. Nikki. And you know, guys, I do want to say this as I'm reading off the names. I totally understand the concept of not bragging about doing good things. Right. And I don't like, you know, when I hear, when I hear, when I do something nice, I don't like to, I don't like to tell people because um, it kind of takes away from the karmic energy. So please don't think that I'm doing that to you guys by naming your names out here. I just want to want to show my appreciation on air for for your generosity and kindness. A Angela uh, Records, um, hundred dollars. Cinnamon Silver, ten dollars. Adele, twenty dollars. Uh, twenty dollars from Lena. Twenty dollars from Barbara. One hundred and fifty from Ben. Um, twenty five from Jan. Twenty five from uh, Amana. 
Uh, $20 from Mark, $20 from Karen, $20 from Irina, $50 from Brooks, $5 from uh, Lu Lucian, um, $20 from Diane, uh, $50 from Happy Brewer, one of the hosts here at TFR, $20 from Suvia, $100 from Brent F uh, Brett Phillips, $200 from Kathy Pope. And I just got to say thank you. And anybody who's donated at first, you know, I'd put, hey, if you donate $100 or more, we'll give you a, a complimentary TFR supporter pass. But anybody who's donated, just write me an email, chrisgeotfrlive.com, and um, we'll hook you up with a TFR supporter pass. I'm going to reach out to everybody here to do that. But uh, it's it's absolutely amazing how in a matter of just a few hours, we were able to um, gather a little bit of funds to help out one of our dear, dear, dear friends. So thank you from the bottom of my heart to everybody out there on behalf of Lucky. And I'm sure she's going to be a million times more appreciative than we are here tonight. But um, it's really incredible to see the unity to see everybody coming together to see everybody kind of supporting one another and especially when we have one of our soldiers here one of our you know the core members mm -hmm. um is having this kind of trouble that she's having i mean it's a fuck situation there's no other way to look at it it's just a fuck situation but um if you want to chip in please do gofundme.com slash lucky with two e's l-u-c-k-e-e -E, or you can go to the front page of tfrlive.com but what I found out as um, this was happening is that um, a couple of people wrote and they said, hey, Chris, I've been in this situation before. And these are people who are on the other side of the world, some people here in the United States. And they said, look, this is a scam. This is a common scam that's being run. And I'm like, I had no idea about this scam. But like four or five people. I mean, you can just go to my Facebook, facebook.com slash Chris Geo Show. Go to the post itself and you'll read other people who are, who are like, hey, this happened to me 20 <coughs> years ago. I just didn't have internet back then. All I had was my own two feet. So I got, had to like literally walk out of the situation. And so um, uh, one of the other guys was telling me, hey, this happens not only with farmers, but it happens with compounds and it happens with other type of groups cults. and cults that you go to this farm or you go to this rancher's house and they say, hey, you know, just uh, come over here and we'll, just help me out on a, on a short-term basis. Stay here for free. Yeah, stay here for free, et cetera, et cetera. And then it changes once you get there. Mm -hmm. And then they start demanding rent. They start demanding that you're out to 12 hours a day that you're basically their slave, their servant, their bitch, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to pay them at the and end of you the pay, Yeah, and, and the reason that they demand the payment is not because they're expecting money from you, but what they do after the fact is once you leave, which you usually leave and leave all your stuff there, yeah. then they, they take all your stuff, they go and file a lost title on your car, they keep your car, mm -hmm. then they go file lawsuits and they start putting uh, liens against other type of property that you may own, or they start filing lawsuits that you owe money, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, there's like a half a dozen people that responded and were like, hey, this happened to me too. This is something serious. And uh, one guy was telling me how this all works and him and a couple of other people have actually helped to remove some of these people out of their situations and he offered to step in and, and help Lucky. And um, as soon as I can speak to her about this possibility, we'll see if, if that's something that needs to be done. Everything seems to be cool right now. Um, her internet's still cut off. I was able to speak to her for, for just a few moments, but um, the guy was just, just insane. Um, he said if, if I didn't pay him $500 today, <laughs> me paying five hundred dollars today then um he was going to cut off her internet and she wasn't going to be able to do a show on monday and i'm like dude fuck you okay fuck yeah. you we're going to get her the hell out of there as quickly and quickly as possible so um thank you so much for for doing that i don't mean to go on and on and on and make a big big deal out of out of, out of it but uh, this this type of story in my opinion is worth exposing this type of scam because it's obviously not a one-time occurrence it's obviously not just you know some psycho dude it's something that has been going on and on and on and on and i know a lot of people that tune into this type of radio show and the station and things like that you know they would love to live on a farm they'd love to have that kind of life and if you get an opportunity like that it's very it's very easy tempting. to and tempting to jump at the opportunity as well and then you get yourself in a situation that you can't get out of and it's the group entanglement, mm -hmm. the cult, et cetera, et cetera. And it takes me right back to the entire message of raw consciousness and hashtag become your own shaman. I really didn't realize the 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 power and the um 
the gravity, that's the word I'm looking for. I didn't realize the gravity of delivering a message, which is individuality, your own path, et cetera, et cetera. Because not only are you susceptible to groupthink, but now we've got situations where people are like actually being kidnapped and held hostage and not able to leave and the resources are taken away from them. And they're basically held prisoner. And so it's even that much more important to hashtag become your own shaman, not fall into any of the group think, not fall into any groups, cults, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and the establishment of boundaries and the ability to keep those boundaries up. The AI is all about unhealthy boundaries being put up and healthy boundaries either coming down or not being built at all. And so we have to we have to relearn what healthy boundaries are and then establish those in our lives even before we meet people. Even before we get online and start meeting other people, there already needs to be those healthy boundaries so that the raw consciousness can shine through without the AI getting in. And as, as long as you're looking to, to others to validate yourself, then you're always going to be exposed to the AI and its influence. That's a good always. point. Yeah. That's, a, that's a really, really, really good point. And... Um... It is all about the the raw consciousness. When you're when you're tapping into the raw consciousness, then you're sure about yourself. You're sure about your path. You're sure, you know, that your path can cross with other paths, and that's fine. And there's a, a time when those paths have to separate. But there's never a a feeling and a need of having to be in a certain group. Um, and which, in my opinion, when you start thinking in that dynamic, you are a lot less susceptible to manipulation, groupthink, and ultimately being trapped. I mean, there's a lot of really bad people out there. And over the last couple of weeks, you know, I I, I was telling her, hey, you have to set up some boundaries. It's, it just sounds like a boundary issue. Just, you know, set up some firm boundaries. But even after she tried doing that, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse to where it's like, all right, now we need SEAL Team Chris and TFR Aww. to come in there and pull her out and yep. extract, extract our her. soldier out of the situation. <laughs> and Extract our asset. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, um, it's incredible. It's incredible. So I, I hope that nobody out there that's listening has been in this type of situation before, because it sounds like a horrifying, horrifying situation. Oh, it sounds like hell. To be yeah. in. So we're about to hit the break here in just a few moments, and I promise we'll get back on track. We will uh, get to some listener questions right on the other side as well. And, and in the second and third hour of the broadcast, we do have Robert W. Sullivan, the fourth. We'll talk about Freemasonry, uh, unraveling the secrets of Freemasonry, and we'll do it from a much, much more much different dynamic. We're going to do it from a raw consciousness perspective, as opposed to what's been done in the past, which is from a truth or perspective or a, a suspicious suspect conspiracy, uh, conspiracy <laughs> perspective or any of that. Like, oh, no, no, I heard about the Masons and I heard this and that. I'm going to listen with an open mind tonight, but I ultimately do want to walk through the rituals. I want to walk, you know, there's a lot of rituals and a lot of degrees, like the sprig of acacia, for example. Um, I think that's like the 16th or the 17th degree. And the acacia confucia is the the plant that we use for our ayahuasca brew. So there's a big connection to the acacia right there in and of itself. But also going back to Egypt, the, the acacia was revered in ancient Egypt. And you see all these motifs of the acacia tree in Egyptian um, mythology and in, in hieroglyphs and so the acacia was revered so why is this 16th or 17th degree called the sprig of acacia let's find out at the second and third hour of the broadcast we'll be right back beings in it, which are as unreal as the universe itself. Therefore, all things are possible beyond the veil.
All right, let's jump back into it. And new now for you. Yes, that was Alan Watts during the break. We take all these old clips and we put them over music for the break so you guys don't have to hear commercials. But our AM and FM affiliates are still happy because they get the segments in the format that they want. So that's the formula behind that. And if you have any suggestions for clips, um, please send them to info at beyondtheveilmedia.com or beyondtheveilradio.com and we will put them in rotation because I always need more, more material. More material, yes. yes. And special thanks to Nancy who just contributed to Lucky's GoFundMe $200. $200. Uh, Mega Huge. Mike, $33. 33 Love you, Mike. Awesome. <laughs> and um, Law Stewart, $25. Guys, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to make sure she gets to a safe place and she can get back on track so yeah. she can um, do what she loves. I mean, her heart and soul is TFR. Yeah. And so um, we want to get her back on track and um, back doing it. But thank you again. And I don't want to harp on about this whole GoFundMe thing because it's not our style. I'm just, I'm so excited to see people coming together to help out one of our own here at TFR. So thank you so much eternally. Um, let's get to some listener questions. Yes. If uh, you don't mind. Somebody named Blair okay. uh, wrote me recently and said, I've been in mind loops over past events, but I have clear audience and the aspects of myself, which fr which are from other lifetimes, timelines and dimensions that have been trying to turn me to the dark side because they want my light. I know you and Chris are busy with all of your work, but I'd appreciate some insight. I'm only 24, but I've been awake and aware my whole life, and I've just been bombarded by them for five months. It's exhausting. I have tried energy clearing them with my light and sending them to the divine source, but they are stubborn as F. <laughs> I really think I maybe need some Aya, Salvia, or Shrooms, but Salvia and Shrooms are so crazy to find where I live. I would love to make some Aya, but I live with my parents. I always trip alone. I'm trying to get some LSD. Maybe that would help. What do you think? All right. You got to keep this a secret. <laughs> you got to keep it a secret. No, I can't reveal the secret. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Let's see. Let's flip a coin. Heads, we reveal the secret. Tails, we don't. And there's a reason why I don't want to reveal the secret. And I'll tell you here. Oh, it's tails. I feel bad about like... Building it up Building now. it up. All right, <laughs> guys. You got to promise me this. Okay, promise me that you won't talk about this in public, like openly. This is probably, hopefully, the only video we're ever going to tag with this. But there is a substance that people have been looking at. It's completely and totally legal. And this is why we don't want to talk about it. It's called 4ACO DMT. You can order it online. Completely legal for research purposes. It's illegal if you're using it for human consumption. But 4ACO DMT... What this does is this metabolizes in the stomach into psilocin. And so uh, mushrooms or psilocybin, that metabolizes into psilocin. 4-ACO-DMT is a, is a um, synthetic. So you do have that element that it is a synthetic, but it metabolizes in the stomach as psilocin. So it's just like a mushroom trip. Now it feels a little more chemically. The come down is a little bit longer and it's a little bit rougher. It's a lot rougher than DMT or um, anything that's natural, uh, mushrooms, et cetera, et cetera. But it's something you can place a discreet order for and it'll arrive right at your door. So I would say that it's a lot better to try something like that than LSD or anything else. Because what we've seen the DEA doing over the past several years and throughout the whole course of the the um, the war on drugs is they've adulterated a lot of the stuff on the streets. So I'm very, very, very skeptical and uh, very time. cautious when it comes to anything that comes from the streets because you don't know what you're getting. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, LSD can take you to those places if you can get some good LSD. And I hear the kids these days, because we're on several different different psychedelic groups, and they're talking about taking like 10 strips of acid at a time. And I'm like, what happened? Are these kids like mega psychonauts or something? I mean, we used to take six hits and that was like, boom, on our ass. 
And one of the older guys was like, no, 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 you don't understand. The stuff we used to take back in the day was about four times stronger than the stuff the kids are taking these days. That's why they're able to take 10 strips at a time. Mm -hmm. And so it's different. And I remember the older people back when we were kids and we were taking LSD, they were telling me the same thing, that um, the stuff that they used to get way back in the day was way, way stronger. And what's happened is there's been a systematic dilution of these chemicals, but there's also been um, the... um, the, um, adulterate, uh, adulteration of things like MDMA and, um, methamphetamine and, uh, heroin, et cetera, et cetera. And these substances aren't dangerous in and of themselves. I mean, heroin is pretty bad. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, but you know, pure heroin is not as bad as the crap you get on the streets. If you inject some pure heroin, because they used to give it in a pharmaceutical setting, in a medical setting, this is where heroin was developed. It was a pharmaceutical, like morphine, for example. Um, in its pure form, it's it's okay to administer, but you get the adulterated crap and it causes the overdoses and craziness and bath salt um, effect where you like run around and you like chop your dick off and you're running around with blood from your crotch and the That's police have salt. to come in here <laughs> and tase you and all of this. And it's because of the adulterants that they've put inside of the chemicals. Mm -hmm. So you can't trust what you get on the street. So um, use your own resources for sure to have these experiences. But if you're in a situation like what the listener mentioned, you may want to look at that, Mm -hmm. the 4ACO DMT, but please don't repeat that. And I promise I will never repeat it either because I want to keep it legal. I don't want everybody under the sun talking about this. Right. Keep it available so that people can continue to enjoy it and continue to utilize it yes um in certain situations it's it's a great substance uh especially for people who can't you know who just don't have the time or the resources to to go on long journeys or to do the others that's a really really good um option another question that we have from azalea if I, w- if I were to make my own ayahuasca at home, could it be dangerous if I drink without a guide? I've been in ceremonies where I felt that I've been possessed by evil energy, and the shaman has had to intervene to keep me from hurting myself. So what I'm worried about is maybe something like that happening again. What's your insight in my experience, and what do you think I should do to make my experience more pleasant? Thanks, Chris, for all your in- helpful information and insight. Thank you for the awesome, awesome comment. And, you know, I, I say this with love. And I say this without, you know, trying without without meaning to (laughs) insult or offend, but the evil spirits are inside of us. The evil spirit is you. Um, It's it's yourself. It's your ego. It's the AI programming that's inside of you. Now, there can be a potential that if you drink completely and totally by yourself, if you've had those experiences in the past, those experiences can definitely repeat Um, the shamaness that was administering it was probably using sage or something else like that. And I'm still kind of on the fence of whether sage actually has a clearing effect or if it's the intention that's put into the smoke as the smoke is released mm-hmm. or if it's just psychosomatic in and of itself. I, I don't know. I know that when Cherie sages me, when I'm having kind of a, a, a rough experience, the smell of it you know, gets into my lungs and it's kind of like a calming. So it could be the smoke itself. I'm not sure. But it sounds like the shamanist was kind of calming you down so you can better deal with that negative energy. Mm-hmm. And just like spirit guides manifest themselves as external forces, the good ones, the ones that want to elevate you, they're ultimately, at the very end of the day, part of our own consciousness, but they manifest Mm -hmm. as external beings because that's what you need to see. Likewise, in order to deal with your with your demons that are inside of you, they have to manifest as an external force um, because you externalize it first so you can better assess it, you can better deal with it, et cetera, et cetera. But once you realize that it's a part of you, that's when you can truly conquer it. And then you don't need the shamaness. You don't need any of that to conquer these because you actually overcome them and release these parts of yourself. And this is what the whole ayahuasca healing is all about. Now, I do recommend having a sitter, especially if you've had situations like that in the past. And maybe you can instruct your sitter, hey, you know, just make sure to keep me calm, light some sage or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't need an actual shaman um i think that's in my experience it's unnecessary it may make people feel a little bit better but um i'll give you an example my my thumb here um i was cutting fish and i sliced it literally with the with the fillet knife and just right to the bone and she was like you need to go to a doctor and i'm like i'm my own shaman right (laughs) 
so we get the alcohol we get everything we clean it out really really well i mean yeah. we did we, we really cleaned it out and i called lucky and i'm like you know i think i should go to the to the doctor and she's like put some super glue on it that's what we used to do in the military mm-hmm. I said okay i put some super glue on it wrapped it up and there's no scar i mean i like fixed it myself now i don't recommend people go do this but i'm just saying we can take these we can take these healing experiences into our own hands because at the end of the day a shaman a um doctor all of that they may have a little bit of extra knowledge but they're all humans at the end of the day just like you and this was one of the big things that i that i i realized when i was young i remember we got a computer i wanted to take it apart and my dad was like no 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 don't take it apart you don't know what you're doing you're gonna ruin it and i i I remember paying this guy like 80 dollars to install a cd drive in my in my computer and i watched him and it was a very simple process he just put it in did a couple of screws and then hooked a couple of wires up and i'm like i can do this and I started taking computers apart. And then I started taking like big machinery apart that I was working with for, for the job I used to have and, and so on and so forth. And I realized, hey, these are all people just like me. All I have to do is just acquire the skills and the knowledge that they have. And there's still some things that I would rather have somebody who's done it over and over. Like I don't open laptops anymore because laptops are just so, I screw up every single laptop that I try to open up. But at the end of the day, it's just another human that's doing that. It's just another human that is doing the same it's just another human um and you have the exact same power as everybody else we're all raw consciousness and because of that we have ultimate power we just have to tap into that ultimate power so um i know that was a long-winded way to answer your question but i would say you don't need a shaman but i definitely (laughs) recommend a sitter wow Everything you just said was exactly what I was going to say. So I will move on to the next question. David said, I have a question about Syrian rue. I have some that's three and a, three plus years old. Can I still use it to prepare a tea? I think I can answer that pretty easily. Um, hold on. Before we get oh. before we get to that, I do want to jump to this question by Jessica oh, Indigo do. because um, she said something very, very, um, uh, very, very profound when it comes to demons. She said, so we don't need to worry about people around us hosting their own demons. Um, okay. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, too, because I believe in energy vampires. I I feel energy vampires. I know that I've picked up negative energies from other people. Mm -hmm. And the question is, are these external forces or are these parts of uh, of those people that kind of cling on to us? So taking a couple of steps back, I started to think about it in computer program terms again and thinking, okay, well, these are just AI programs on the spiritual level that have been infected with this particular person. And then we, they, they cling on to us and we can pick them up through sexual activity with the wrong type of people. We can open ourselves up to these kind of energies when we're drinking, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, there is that external force, but ultimately it's, it becomes an internal thing. Like it jumps from, from that other person. Okay. What's what's a good way to um to to describe this? I'm trying to think it's like almost like a smell well, that it's, contaminates it, something. Yeah, or it's like a like like an energy like a frequency. Okay, it's like a frequency that that one person is vibrating at, and you're vibrating at another, and that frequency gets too close to you, and so it changes your frequency to start vibrating at the same resonance as that other frequency, the negative frequency. So we don't actually pick up external forces but rather are it's changing our f- frequency makeup within us um if that makes any sense i don't know how does how does that sound yeah, it, that sounds really good to me it's more like a like a smell thing i have a really really acute sense of smell and um i can walk into a room and i can i can tell you when the last time a kitchen was like something was cooked in a kitchen i can tell you um whether somebody has showered in the last couple of days or not i can i can smell it seems like i can smell people that are homeless a mile away it's it's a really strong sense of smell and i noticed that if somebody has a certain smell if it's a really strong scent it will rub off on other people as they're hugging them and stuff and it'll stick around for several hours afterwards and then it calms down and then you don't have that smell anymore um, the same thing is true for that energy thing that Chris was talking about, where if I'm I'm especially sensitive to it uh, because of my birth chart, it actually says that um, I'm really sensitive and empathic to other people's energy frequencies. So whenever they come to me, 
I could be at a high frequency, but by the time they walk away from me, I'm as low as they are because they're such at a low frequency. And so I think it has to do with our birth charts and our astrology and and all of these different aspects kind of line up to to tell us how how uh, susceptible we are to our energy being able to be changed by other people. And that's different for everybody. However, I I wonder if there's such a thing as these demons and especially demonic possession demonic possession to me seems like um it's simply a medical case of um hysteria it's it's basically just dementia and hysteria put together well, I, 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 could, I could very easily see how um you create that type of setting. You have a priest there. You have a, a religious, and it's usually very, very religious people that right. get demonically possessed. Right. It seems like a psychosomatic kind of response that is exacerbated by the entire mm -hmm. uh, environment. Religiosity. That, yeah, the exorcism takes place yeah. in. So, you know, you bring in a priest, you bring in an exorcist, you bring in all that, and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse um, because the person's manifesting it worse in their minds. Now, Jessica also raised a really good uh, question about um, are these demons feeding upon us? Because there are energy vampires out there mm -hmm. and there are things that actually like suck on your energy. I've seen these astral parasites within the, the realm. Um, um, I, I understand reptilians are out there. I understand um, greys are out there as well. But the gnosis and the realization that I've come to is that these are all manifestations ultimately of this artificial intelligence. Right. See, this is the game changer here. This is how it changed the entire dynamic mm -hmm. is looking at these things rather than these beings that are out of control that are, you know, outside of our frequency range. It's part of this huge construct. It's part right. of the construct. And by separating the raw consciousness from the artificial intelligence, it all starts to to separate and then a barrier becomes formed around the raw consciousness element as it starts to separate itself from the AI, which includes reptilians and um, demons and uh, gray aliens, etc. I don't really have too much of a problem with grays or demons or any of that or um, reptilians. Like, I mean, I know some people that are they're like constantly under attack by reptilians, but I'm like, no, it's not reptilians. It's this artificial intelligence fucking with things. And by doing that, it's so much easier. Like, I mean, we have been through some hell over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> yes. Not only us, not only our friends, but I mean, it just seems like everybody's going everybody. through this wave. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, it was so easy to overcome because it's like, hey, it's just the AI messing with things. It's OK. I'm raw consciousness. I'm going to mm -hmm. overcome this. And it just changed the dynamic. So I think that's the, the, the biggest thing that the raw consciousness idea can do is change the dynamic on how we handle these things. Right, right. Uh, these things are always going to happen. That's that's one thing that I've learned since 2015 when Chris went through what we've termed the long night of the soul, the long dark night of the soul. And then throughout 2016 and 2017, when I went through mine, is that these things are going to continue happening. It's not that as soon as you realize the raw consciousness, everything disappears or everything bad goes away or nothing frustrating ever happens again. That's the AI way of thinking. That's setting yourself up for failure. That's that's basically sabotaging yourself before you even get started. However, if you know that these things are going to happen, if you know that these frustrations are going to come, you know that things are not going to work right then it it makes it much easier to handle these things as they come just one after the other boom 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 just knock them out rather than focusing on oh my god this is going to keep happening it's never going to stop right and it's also about expecting the unexpected mm -hmm. because when you're expecting it then you're like okay cool yeah. this is a passing phase it's not mm -hmm. a big deal i mean you know a couple of weeks ago every piece of electronic that we owned started breaking down yeah. including the car battery the boat battery mm -hmm. i mean you name it and i was like you know what not a big deal 
we're just going to get through it. And eventually and very shortly, this wave is going to stop. So one happened and I was like, OK, well, probably another one's going to happen. Yeah. So, boom, another one happened. And I'm like, cool. I expected that. I was already ready, prepared to take care uh -huh. of that. Take care of the other one. Take care of the other one. He and that's that. He already had a battery ready to put in the to put in the car because we had a feeling that the battery was going to go out. Next. Right. Now, the flip side of that is what if, you know, people may come back and say, well, if you're expecting it, then, then maybe you're manifesting not, no. it. I don't think so. I don't think so no. either. I um, think. Because I've been through both. I've been yeah. through the part of, you know, not expecting to go, oh, my God, I'm under attack. I need help. I need uh -huh. I need my shields. I need to call clears. I need to do this. I need to do that. And I've been through the part of I expect it. It's OK. I got my light sword. Not a big deal. Right. It's part of being in this construct. And I was able to overcome it much more efficiently by saying it's part of this construct. It's OK. And uh, this is a very passing phase and everything will be great here in just a few moments. Yes, exactly. Should I move on to the next question? Because we've only got a few minutes left before we hit the break and bring Robert on. So um, David said, I have a question about Syrian Rue. I have some that's three plus years old. Can I still use it to prepare a tea? Um, yes, you absolutely can. I would boil it at uh, at least 170 or 180 degrees. Just boil it first. But it should be good for several years, actually. So especially if you freeze it, that also helps. Um, Jez Jexzi said, so what role do black holes play in this construct? I don't know what hole, what. What roles do black holes play in this construct? It could be portals <sighs> to different layers of the construct. Yeah, I mean. You know, you start you start looking at it at this, from this raw consciousness perspective and you start to question literally everything. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a black hole, so I can't really tell you that one actually exists. Right. And you start to weed through all the propaganda and NASA and so on and so forth. And then you go, okay, well, wait a minute. This is an artificial construct and is space even real? Are other planets real? What about nebulas and black holes and et cetera, et cetera? I mean... I'm pretty sure that the sun is real because I can see the sun very clearly. Um, I don't know what the sun is. It seems to be like some kind of energy radiating thing. Is the sun really, what do they say, 300 million miles away? Probably, I think it's more than that. An astronomical unit, 92 million miles away. I don't remember off the top of my head, but is it really that far away or is it something that's closer? I, I really don't know. So then, you know, you start to ask these other questions and say, okay, well, do black what are black holes and the first reaction obviously is to say well black holes are portals or other theories were that black holes are the other side of the sun so you have like the sun in this dimension which is shining the positive energy or the light energy and then the other dimension the flip side of that sun is a dark black hole type of energy which is um some scientific quantum uh no not quantum that's not the right word uh um, astro, astro scientific. There's a word I'm looking for. I can't think of it, but um, astrophysical, a astrophysics. Yeah. Astrophysics, yeah. Um, uh, theoretical astrophysics. That's the term mm -hmm. I'm looking for. And, um, you know, so you, you have those ideas, but again, like who knows for sure. And if it's an artificial construct, then any, everything and anything is an illusion anyway. So where do you go from that point inwards? That's the mm -hmm. only place to go. That is the only place to go. And only place to go. Black holes could actually be, you know how they're, they say the, the macrocosm is just the representation of the microcosm as above, so below. Black holes are, are basically just a really bad depression. You know, it's the long, dark night of the soul. You have no idea when it's going to end. You're just kind of falling into a bottomless pit and hoping that you come out the other side okay. You know, that's what depression really is. And, you know, when you have that really bad depression. Um, let's see. Santa from Finland gave our last question. I know we're about to hit the break. She said, I just watched your video about the solar eclipse as seen on ayahuasca. It made me confused and curious. I kind of feel that what you told in the video is the truth. I couldn't fully understand everything since English is not my mother tongue. Um, 
I'm afraid, I'm kind of afraid, not like super afraid, but still that I'm asking and talking to the wrong thing, which apparently is the AI. Many times I ask some things from the angels, etc. And now I wonder, is that correct at all? Since I understand that the divinity is inside of us. Ooh. The divinity is inside the of The divinity you. is inside. Absolutely. So. As I said, sometimes the raw consciousness manifests as angels, as guides, etc., etc., and you'll best know it by the resonance and the information that it's giving you. Yes. But there comes a certain point where you realize that's all inside. And that's that's the next levels, in my opinion. At mm -hmm. least, I mean, that was a progression that I went through, which is why I talk about this, because I, I, I hope to give people that boost to those next levels without having to go through a lot of the pitfalls too so don't go anywhere we'll be right back robert w sullivan coming up right here on beyond phase the veil completed. phase two will be initiated momentarily beyond the veil all right robert w sullivan the fourth will be joining us in t minus five minutes but right now we have astro watch with mrs geo and I just got word that Robert doesn't have video, so I'm gonna have to do a quick setup of the um, of his picture yeah, real quick. So yeah. why don't you take over Astro Watch so I got time to do that? Absolutely. Mars is about to trigger a challenging T-square with an opposition to Chiron and a square to Saturn. The T-square began to build from October 3rd and will last until October 20th. Mars opposite Chiron is rather like a wounded soldier, forced to slow down or stop by Saturn. Mars loves to move fast, muscle his way through, and just get it done, but the situation is sensitive. That's Chiron. Maybe Mars has to move more gently for a while. Consider other people's feelings. Oppositions tend to manifest in our relationships. We might be tempted to project our weaknesses on others, too, during this time. But Saturn says we have to take responsibility for where we've been wounded or damaged. Mars needs to initiate repairs in practical, organized Virgo. Being accountable for our actions and sensitive to the needs of others helps us to move forwards, even if a little more slowly than normal. This pattern is at play in the full moon on October 5th, as Mars is the ruler of this Aries lunation. The moon is also square to Pluto and opposite Mercury, bringing in a theme of mental pressure, intense communication, and even fighting talk. Black and white thinking could cause some to act out. The background T-square suggests restraint, but frustration was palpable. Thankfully, Saturn is coming up to a trine with the North Node on October 9th, that's in two days, suggesting that attributes such as patience, self-discipline, and a mature attitude are needed to facilitate evolutionary growth during this time. The biggest shift this month comes with Jupiter's entry into Scorpio on October 10th. Scorpio is a fixed water sign characterized by intensity and focus. Scorpio represents the underbelly of society, the things that we're not supposed to talk about in polite company. It's the secrets we hold, complexes, the dark territory of fear, sex, death, and taxes is often the casual descriptor. Scorpio is also the detective of the Zodiac, and it comes with an inherent ability to keep digging until it gets to the truth. It strips away all of the inessential stuff it get, until it gets to the fundamental core of, the, of a subject, person, or concept. Scorpio is the x-ray that reveals not only your bones, but your soul. Jupiter shows us where there is a development potential. His entry into Scorpio suggests that we have an increasing need for truth and intimacy. We need to look at the meaning of our fear, the beliefs we hold about sex, the judgments we hold about bonding and relationships. As Jupiter magnifies what he touches, this may indicate a period where there could be greater open discussion about sex and sexuality, and perhaps too a growing movement to address the growth of sexual crimes. Scorpio also rules rubbish, so perhaps we could see a significant growth in recycling. Scorpio and the eighth mundane house of the global chart is also associated with shared resources. Technically, Jupiter's passage here can bring some beneficial growth to banks and a more open book approach to financial contracts and commitments. However, Jupiter can sometimes incite such optimism that we invest far too into the future, increasing our debt. Jupiter will try Neptune during this time in Scorpio, so idealism too is likely to increase. Well, I have a great idea. Let's bring Robert W. Sullivan on right on the other side here at Beyond the Veil. Excellent. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome, fellow traveler, to phase two of the journey. The path to enlightenment begins from within and spreads outwards into the universe. As the universe is the manifestation of the essence of consciousness, no outward motion can occur without inward transformation. As such, it is up to you, the traveler, to unlock what awaits beyond the veil. All right, hour number two right here on Beyond the Veil, the moment you've been waiting for, our dear friend, longtime friend, uh, Robert W. Sullivan IV, 32nd degree Freemason. Do you want to go ahead and introduce him? Do you have the bio yes, in front I of you? Yes, I do. Because I do not have my I dorky do. little glasses on tonight. Oh, I moved them. I moved them to the other room. That's right. Ah, yes. Robert W. Sullivan IV is a philosopher, historian, antiquarian, jurist, lay theologian, mystic, radio TV personality, writer, best-selling author, CEO, and lawyer. He's also a Freemason, having become a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason in 1999. The Royal Arch of Enoch, the impact of Masonic ritual, philosophy, and symbolism was a his first published work and was the result of 20 years of research. In 2014, he released Cinema Symbolism, a guide to esoteric sim- Im- imagery in, uh, in popular movies, which was republished this year. His third book, Simul- Cinema Symbolism 2, More Esoteric Imagery from Popular Movies, was published just a few months ago. He is currently writing his first work of fiction, as well as another book on masonry titled Freemasonry and the Path to Babylon. Oh, fantastic. That sounds interesting. Robert W.I.V. Dot com is that the website? Yes, Robert okay. W. Sullivan IV. Uh, Robert com. W. Sullivan. Yes, that's it. IV. com. Robert, how are you doing, sir? Hey, Chris. Hi, Cherie. Thank you for having me so back, so much back on uh, Truth Frequency tonight. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, you know it's always uh, wonderful to be here with you guys. Thank you for inviting me back. I much appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very us. much for joining us. It's always a pleasure and an honor. And I've got to say, you know, I've known you for several years. And you have significantly, significantly changed my perspective on Masonry. All the conspiracy theories out there, the 9-11 truth movement, et cetera, et cetera. Blame the Masons for everything. Oh, I stubbed my toe. It must be the Masons. Um, my wife cheated on me. It must be the Masons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, I, I think the Masons have been kind of scapegoated. And you have really opened up a whole new perspective. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you so much for that. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm glad to hear that because... When I, when I wrote uh, Cinema Symbolism, excuse me, when I wrote Cinema Symbolism, when I wrote my first book, um, the, the Royal Arch of Enoch, um, there was really two things going on in masonry at the time. There was um, this idea that, you know, you know there was, it was almost like there was, you know, like you said at the beginning, there was this contor- conspiratorial el- element where the masons were, you know, in charge of everything and were responsible for everything. And then there was another side of it, and this was more coming from the Masonic um, standpoint within masonry, because you know this was ni- you know in the ni- in the two thousands. I mean, I became a mason in the late nineteen nineties. Was the masons have nothing to do with anything? It's just a fraternal order that does barbecues and big bingo night, and we had do some charity work. P- period. That's all there is. Um, and of course, neither is correct. Um, the the masons are not responsible for every world calamity or anything like that. But they are influential, and there is, you know, their fingerprints can be found found on things that a lot of Masons often denied. And I think I think the reason for that was because it, it, it fueled it fuel fu- uh, gasoline sort of on the conspiratorial flames. One of my motivations for writing the first book was to sort all this out and and to explain to people what the motivation was all this. That it wasn't this deep, dark, demonic, you know, conspiracy going on. It was really nation building. It was using the tools and symbolism of Freemasonry. So, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you if I, you know, you know, this was part of my motivation for for writing the very first book was to, you know, sort all this out into, you know, the the answers. The truth was always in the middle. It wasn't the Masons aren't responsible for everything, but they weren't responsible for every, you know, call conspiracy out there either. 
Right. And that's something that I've learned um, going through this. I want to get in, if you don't mind, this is a little bit sure. different of what, we're, what we've talked about before, but I want to go through the degrees of masonry and, you know, whatever you can reveal and what you can't, I completely respect that. And I, I understand secret handshakes, things like that. But I, I was hoping tonight, maybe we can take the audience through the steps of masonry, maybe the different degrees. And somebody asked in the chat, and I, I want to get to this question later for sure. So I'm just making a mental note of it right now um why aren't you a 33rd degree and i know the answer to that and uh, i've met a lot of 30 seconds and i understand what the 33rd degree is and the importance of the 33rd degree but i want to start at the very beginning through the point of initiation for example how far down this path can you take us well right you 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 if you join if the person joins a blue lodge of freemasons and you have to petition them to join uh, and, and this is degrees one, two, and three. Th th this is your starting point. Uh, you, you can't go anywhere in any of the high degrees or anything like that, or any of the auxiliary organizations, um, you know, if, 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 until you do the first three degrees of masonry. And you have to be, uh, you, you have to solicit the lodge to join. You have to fill out a membership. You have to uh, cut them a check. Uh, and, and it, it, you know, you'll go through a committee. Um, at least this is the way I did it. Um, some lodge are different um but I went to a committee they they met with me and then the petition it gets voted on and if you pass uh they they, they will usually call you and and notify you of an initiation date uh this this is usually several months later um i petitioned the lodge to join in 1996 in the summer uh, and of course when i when, when i when i did all this the um the lodge is closed during the summer it's what's called going dark there, there's no lodge meetings in july and august and the reason for that is because um back in the day there was no air conditioning um and it was too hot, it was ah. too hot. Oh, that makes sense i thought they just wanted to go hang out on the lake and stuff like that yeah no, have barbecues. It's actually, it, <laughs> yeah it, it's actually that there, there are no lodge meetings in july and august it's what's called going dark and the reason is, is because back in the day, there was no air conditioning. And this is a tradition that's carry on, carried on to this day. It usually picks up in September. You, you will occasionally find where they'll have a, a special meeting in August or something in July, but it's rare. Uh, so so I, I petitioned, I think, in July. And then I went through the interview process in September and October, and I got voted on. And it wasn't until January that I, I got initiated at the first degree, which is called Entered Apprentice. Um, you get you get initiated as entered apprentice. And then again, it, so some lodges in different jurisdictions vary on this. Once you get initiated, you have to go through what's called a catechism. And, and the way that works is you learn orally a series of questions and answers. Uh, and, and it's all prescripted. There's no thought process you get asked a question has a predetermined answer what a lot of lodges like to do is they they, they split this up the wait till this, this can delay the process the wait till like two or three other people are um entered as apprentices and then they'll get get a class together and everybody learns a certain question and answer and that helps speed it up basically because you don't have to memorize the whole thing you only have to remember memorize like you know seven out of you know 50 questions or whatever and then you go in front of a lodge um, and then you pass this catechism, you, you take it in front of the Lodge Brothers. And like I said, it's, it's all prescripted. There's no made up answers. You sit there and you, you know, get asked the question, you give them the answer. Um, if that passes, and it usually does, you get the next degree that night. That's the way at least it happened for me. So I did the Entered Apprentice degree. And like I said, this could take months to do. I did the Entered Apprentice degree in January of 97. I didn't do the fellow craft until May of uh, of 97. So it was four months later. Um, and then again, it was the same thing with the Master Mason degree, which is uh, the final degree. And of course, at that point in May, you're getting ready to go dark. You only have one month left, which is June. Um, so I didn't go through, but, but then you have the summer to learn the next catechism. And then at that point, this was September now, I did the third degree, which I passed the, the second degree catechism, came back to the lodge, did the third degree, you know, passed the catechism, and then uh, got raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason, it's called. Now, even at that point, you're, and again, it depends on jurisdiction, you have to take a catechism on the third degree, and that they really like to speed up. Um, because, you know, at that point, you are the third degree, and they just want to get the catechism over with. I think I did that like two or three weeks later. Uh, and then once that passes... Well, before, that before, we, before we get to the, the higher degrees, sure. let me take a couple of steps back. During the sure. initiation, for example... Um, right. Are you allowed to talk about the actual rituals themselves, or how deep can you go to get into that? 
No, no, you're you're you you're not. You when when you're going through it, um, you know, you're not supposed to talk, um, you know, about any of it. You're sworn to secrecy, uh, and you know, you you go through it. The first degree, you know, what I would describe as sort of an introductory degree. The second degree is what I would call uh, is what I would call sort of an informative degree, and it's really the third degree is really what you would call the esoteric degree. And I should also point out that when you do the degrees. Um, when, when you get done them, when you actually do the ritual, um, you come back outside and they, they put you in a costume. It, it looks like pajamas. And when, when you get done the ritual, you can, you go back outside and put your regular clothes back on. You go into like a, a, a an antechamber. And then after that's over, there'll be a break. And then you come back in and, um, you sit there and you get a lecture from the worshipful master about some of the information you just went, went through. It's, it's a little, um, at that point in time, you're kind of like unnerved and you're, you know, kind of, you know, not all there. So a lot of the lecture, the catechism, uh, not the catechism, but the, the, the lecture that the worshipful master gives you goes by you. Now, some of it will stick, um, but by and large, you won't remember it. Um, and, and, you know, you can read about it, you know, in different in different, you know, Masonic uh, books and everything. But then, you know, you, you, every time you go through a degree, you get this lecture. Um, and here here's sort of the issue with it. Um, and, and, you know, this is what people are forgetting. Like when you do the entered apprentice degree, there's three degrees to the Blue Lodge. It's the entered apprentice master, you know, fellow craft and master mason. They have to open the lodge um, in that degree. Uh, and then what they do is um, they, they open the degree in the entered apprentice because only you can be there for that. And then once the ritual is done, they open the degree then in the, the lodge in the fellow craft and then close it immediately, then open it in a third degree so they can do their normal business. Once they open the lodge in a different degree, you can't go in anymore. So essentially your night's over and you can go home, although they'll still be there you know, doing their doing business and things like that. Um, so you go up for the you know entered apprentice degree and you go through it and then you get the lecture, they'll still be there and you have to basically leave um, because you can't go in because they're, they're opening the lodge in different degrees in the higher degrees, second, third degree, which you can't be a part of. Oh. Um, so, you know, you, you'll get kind of stuck with that. Uh, it's a, you know, it's definitely a little um, arcane, but it's the way they work. And then, you know, when you come back for the second degree, you'll be sitting there, you know, and, and they'll open the lodge in the entered apprentice degree where well, you can stay there for that. Um, and then they'll open it for the fellow crib and you got to go out and leave and change and then they'll come back in for the ritual. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's you know, and then, then once you get done the fellow crib and you get the lecture on that, they'll open the lodge in the third degree and then you've got to leave again. Um, you can't stay for that. You know, it, it's only until you receive the third degree and go through the ritual and get the lecture and then do the catechism that bang, you're done. You're a Freemason. You can come up anytime you like to. Okay, so let, let me ask you this. Um, sure. If you can't talk about the actual rituals themselves, I, I, I completely well, understand I can, that. I can to a new, I can Oh, do can a, you? Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, to a degree. Okay. Go ahead. Ask, ask so, so the initiation, um, you talked about that. Uh, I know you've talked about Hiram Abiff in the past <laughs> and um, some of the connections to um, Solomon's Temple, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Does the initiation itself, and then I also want to ask the same about the Fellow Craft and the Master Mason degrees, does that echo from the same kind of... Um, uh, the same kind of historical or biblical um, foundations. Right, right. Well, the first, it, it, the degrees are different. They, they, they parallel each other, but it's really in the first degree, you essentially get brought in in this costume. You're blindfolded for half of it, and you essentially just get led around the lodge um, and you kind of just get like, you know, inspected almost, you know, and, you know, you, you know, is this, you know, is this the guy and you answer yes. And you, you come in and, and then like, like you kneel, when you get a brought in, you'll, you, you, you kneel down. Um, and then they ask you a question and you give a predetermined answer and you, you get sort of like a, a, escorted around the lodge complex. And then you take the oath, um, and, uh, you know, at the altar. And then after that, um, you know, you have your, your blindfold removed and I think you're just given a little instruction. Um, and then essentially the, the ritual is over with, um, and then you come back out, um, and then you change and then you, you know, you put in your regular clothes, you get out of the little, you know, pajamas and then you come back in, um, and you get the lecture you know, and when, when the ritual is over with, um, you, you, you know, there'll, there'll be a break, um, the, the, they'll definitely stop and they'll all come out and then you can change. And then at that point, you'll get brought back in and then you'll give you'll be given the lecture. 
Um, and it's the same thing with the fellow the fellow craft. You'll get more instruction. It's it's not until the third degree that it becomes more participatory. Um, and you know, where you take on the role of Hiram Abiff, that doesn't happen until the third degree. The first and second are more. You know, like I said, I would describe as is really the, the first is introductory and the second is more, uh, you know, explanatory. Okay. It's not until you get to the third degree that you actually, you know, get into the theorem of Biff legend. That doesn't come till the third degree. OK, so what did you get out of masonry going through the first three degrees after you became a master mason? Uh, because I've talked to people on Facebook, for example, that have been master masons for 30 years. They never aspire to move any any higher. And um, I imagine that in the higher degrees is where the rituals really start to um, have meaning and have knowledge of self, et cetera, et cetera. But many people choose to stay at that master Mason level. So just to kind of get an idea of where they are, um, what did you get out of the first three degrees? Right. Well, I, I would describe them as, as the whole idea with the first, the, the whole, it, it's different for every Mason. For me, it was the idea that, okay, I've, I've gone through this, I've gone through this sort of rebirth. And the idea is that you've gone through this symbolic death and resurrection. So that the, the whole idea with it, and this is sort of what resonated with me, was that you've been reborn into light and now you can affect positive change in, in the in the community. That that's what I got out of it. Um I would definitely say the 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 degrees are esoteric. Um you'll get explained some of the esoteric symbolisms. Um and, you know, it's 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 the higher degrees beyond that point are not mandatory. It's, it's really, you know, that's one of the things about Freemasonry. You won't have your hand turned or, or put your arm behind your back. It's completely up to you if you want to stay in the Blue Lodge and have no real interest in the higher degrees. Um, that's up to you that, you know, it's, it's completely up to you if you d decide to go into the high degree bodies. There, there are really two. The two premier are the York right and the Scottish right. They parallel each other. Um, and the, the, there are other auxiliary bodies, um, that, that are open as well. I mean, and the, these vary jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Some are more popular than others. You know, you get into think groups like the Shriners or the Tall Cedars in, in Maryland. One of the ones that's real popular with my, with my lodge was Yed's Grotto. Uh, that, that's one you don't hear too often, but that's real popular in, in my lodge. So you, you can join these auxiliary bodies. You can, you can, if you want to, um, it's not mandatory. But it's you'll, you'll go through the ritual and you'll get some instruction. And at this point in time, I would say, you know, this is where it's kind of up to the individual Mason to, 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 to decipher or go on with what, you know, they want to do. Um, if 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 they're interested, you know, you know, you'll go through the ritual and you might not think you know much of it or you, you go through and think, OK, you know, that that's the ritual. If you start reading um, and this won't be told to you, this is really one of the things you have to do on your own. But if you really start reading the works of people like Albert Mackey or Albert Pike, you know, or myself, uh, shameless plug, you'll really begin to understand some of the deeper meanings of the ritual, what it's about. Um, and, you know, you can take it from there and you'll, you'll start to see comparisons with ancient religion, with Christianity, with uh, things like that. And that, that to me was really the intriguing aspect of it. I see. Okay. You know, I've always likened you to kind of a, a modern day Albert Pike. So uh, I, well, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, when I read your work, that's what I think. Uh, definitely. Um, so the York Rite and the Scottish Rite are the two paths, the two most tra traveled paths of a traveling man. And um, how do you determine which one you go down? Um, I mean, obviously, you went down the Scottish right. Can right. do people go down both of them, or um, what? How do the two compare? Right, that's a good question. Uh, the York, the, 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 you can join both. Uh, there is no prohibition against one or the other. You can't if you join one. It's not like oh, you can't join the other one. You can join both. The Scottish right is more popular than the York right because. By and large, the York Rite is what I would describe as Christian Freemasonry. Um, it, it, it has a Christian element in it that is not present in Blue Lodge Masonry and not present in uh, the Scottish Rite. Uh, in, in the Blue Lodge, you will clearly find elements of Judaism and Christianity, no question about it. But the Blue Lodge is deistic. It, it, it requires belief in a supreme being. Uh, that's it. Uh, the Scottish Rite requires, you know, you have to believe, obviously, in a supreme being, but there is no religious component, per se, in the Scottish Rite. Now, again, 
A lot of the rituals revolve around Judaism and Christianity. If you join the York Rite, the rituals, um, again, are Judaism and Christianity. But the final body of the York Rite is the Knights Templar. Um, and they require, and this is this is separate from most of Freemasonry, in order to join the Knights Templar, you have to swear allegiance to Jesus Christ. If you do not do that, you cannot, be, or you do not want to do that, you cannot join the Knights Templar. Um, now, technically, you could join the York Rite and go through the degrees and stop before you get to the Knights Templar. You could do that. Um, the, the, the Knights Templar are only, is only available you can only join the York Rite or the Knights Templar is if you swear allegiance to Christianity and you have been exalted to the Holy Royal Arch in the York Rite. So um, let me let me jump in for just a moment because sorry. this is okay. this is where people, uh, you know, this is where there's a lot of confusion because um, I have another friend, thirty second degree. Um, he went through the Scottish Rite and the York Rite at the same time, I believe. I, I didn't ask him as extensively his background as as I've spoken to you about, but he's a Knights Templar ultimately. And he took right. an oath to uphold the teachings of Jesus Christ. And right. you've got all of these conspiracies saying Freemasonry is satanic, they worship Lucifer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the very top, at least on the York Rite, they have taken an oath to uphold the teachings of Jesus Christ. Where did this mix-up come in? Right. It comes in, um, it comes in from Albert Pike, uh, who wrote a book called Morals and Dogma of the Scottish Rite. Um, and I, again, I've, I've been on the show. I think I've even mentioned the show. And no time in any of Freemasonic rituals, Lucifer mentioned. Um, if you go through the Blue Lodge, the most important symbol and the whole Blue Lodge system is revolves around the sun. Um, the entire Blue Lodge, I mean, I call it in the books a solar clerisy. Um, it, it, it th think of a, it, it's almost secular Jesuits is a better, better way to describe it. The most important symbol with, within Freemasonry is the sun. Um, the lodge complex is based on the sun. Uh, the worshipful master sitting in the east representing the rising sun, uh, the junior warden, his helper sitting in the, uh, nor or excuse me, sitting in the south as the sun at meridian, and then the senior warden, um, in the west as the setting sun. Uh, even the square and compasses is a, is a solar allegory. Um, and what Pike talks about in Morals and Dogma, Dogma is he makes a comparative religion reference where he compares the planet Venus to Lucifer. And the reason he does this is because he says, he, he says uh, essentially, in, in the morning sky before the sunrise, the planet Venus will sit there in the eastern sky in the early morning hours, heralding the sunrise. And, and Venus is equated with false light. Uh, it's not the true light. The true light is the sun. Venus is the herald or bringer of the sun. So when you see the sun, uh, when you see Venus, excuse me, you know the sun is on its way. And again, Venus, you know, and this is in, in Greco-Roman mythology, would be the love goddess you know, Aphrodite or, or, you know, one of those, but it equates to Lucifer, uh, you know, this fallen angel because it's false light. It's not the true light, which is the sun. So in Morals and Dogma, Pike says, is it Venus that brings the sunrise? And he says, yes. And then he says, is, could you say, is it Lucifer that brings the sun or the light? He says, yes. And he even says, he said, it's a weird name to give to the, I'm almost quoting him verbatim here. He says, it's such a strange name to give to the Prince of Darkness, the Herald of the Sunrise, you know, the, the announcer of the light. That's all it is. Um, and people have picked up on this to mean that this is somehow devil worship or anything, where all Pike is talking about is comparative symbolism, comparative religion, equating Venus. Well, hold right there. On the other side, I want to talk about the Eastern Star. I know we're diverting just a little bit, but up on the screen, I have the symbol of the Eastern Star. So I'm going to let everybody meditate on that over the break. Come to your own conclusions. Then we'll get the truth from Robert W. Sullivan right here on Beyond the Veil. Body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in you be not darkness, as you step beyond the veil. All right, we are back speaking with Robert W. Sullivan IV. 
Robert W. Sullivan, IV.com, the website. Cinema Symbolism, the Royal Arch of Enoch, and uh, many more works that you can find. And uh, I want to get into those as well, but I'm really, really curious about uh, Freemasonry and, and getting to the truth. It's looking at Freemasonry from a raw consciousness perspective, not through truth or goggles, not through uh, tinted go uh, conspiracy theory tinted goggles or anything like that, but looking at it from truth. And it seems to like echo the same thing up is down, left is right, et cetera, et cetera. Everything that I thought I knew I had to like completely throw out when I tapped into the raw consciousness element of myself and I threw away all of my BS. I threw away all of my belief systems and just started seeing things for what they are. Up on the screen, we have the symbol of the Eastern Star. And many people would look at this symbol and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is an evil satanic symbol. Clearly, it is a, a pentagram, which is an upside down pentacle. Um, the pentacle right side up with the star with the, with the tip pointed upwards is a... Um, I don't want to use the term pagan because pagan is a derogatory term made up by the church back in 325 AD to categorize anything non-Christian, but um, it's a, a, a Wiccan. That's a bit, maybe a better term. Wiccan. And you would look at a symbol like this and liken this to Satanism. But when I went beyond the veil and I started to really look at what this symbol actually means, it was the complete opposite of what I thought it was. Robert, can you tell us about the Eastern Star symbol and what the five points actually represent? Which, when I found out, it just blew my mind completely. Well, it, it depends on the context. And again, if you read Albert Pike, I mean, the the pentagram usually when the one points up and the two and the two when the one points up and the two points are down, it's white magic. When the two points up or one point down, it's it's dark magic, left hand path, you could say. Um, the the you know, you read Albert Pike, you know, it, you can symbolize um, mastery over the four elements, you know, earth, air, fire, water, and the fifth The fifth point is your mastery over them. Um, you know, the Eastern Star with the two points up and the one point down. In, in masonry, especially in the Blue Lodge, and especially in the third degree, it represents the Egyptian dog star, Sirius. Um, and I suspect when they were crafting um, the Eastern Star, so I mean, that's the Eastern Star, you know, Sirius. You know, what's the star of the East? Sirius. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a reference, you know, what, what's Sirius sacred to it's the Virgin mother Isis. Um, and the Eastern star is a woman's organization within masonry. Um, you know, when, when they have it with the two points up, my gut feeling is that probably was done for aesthetic please purposes. There's nothing at all, uh, satanic, um, with, with the, uh, Eastern star, I can assure you of that. Well, let me, um, let me jump in for a moment because what I, the, the research that I came across and it, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I don't know, um, anything compared to what you've, you've researched. Um, but it comes from five women from the Bible, Ada, Ruth, Esther, Martha, and Electa, five women from the Bible, from the book of judges. Right. Right, right. That's right. The, 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 then you get into um, with, within the Eastern Star. I'm just giving you within the Masonic uh, standpoint. Within Eastern Star, you get into the five women and coming out of the Bible. I mean, that's right. And again, it's, it's like you said, um, you know, a, a lot of this stuff, a lot of the negativity towards it. I mean, it, it has to do with comparison. People will say, whoa, the Church of Satan uses a pentagram, which is true. They do. And no, the Masons use one. So they equate. And what I, what I always stress in my work, and especially this comes true when you're doing the movie breakdowns, um, it's context. You have to look in the context of how the symbol is being used, because one group using it as a context, you know, doesn't necessarily what another group uses. It doesn't have the same meaning. Um, I mean, this is true with the pentagram, as you pointed out with the Eastern Star within masonry. It has to do with the Virgin Mother Isis. Esoterically, it has to do with the same thing with the Eastern Star. I mean, the Eastern Star is serious, but you're right. The five points you get into the five uh, women from the Bible, which you're absolutely spot on with. Um, so, you know, you know, when, when you get into this, I would just stress this is remember that the context is so critical because it, it can mean different things to different people in different groups at different times. This is especially true when you're doing the movie symbolism, um, a symbol in one movie can mean something completely different in another movie. You know, I mean, practically speaking, you know, the pentagram can mean one thing in the Eastern Star, one thing to the Church of Satan, and one thing to the Freemasons, completely different. Um, and also when it comes to symbolism, um, another thing I would stretch, uh, stress, excuse me, is 
I mean, and this you'll find in all Masonic literature when, when you sit down and start reading it. Uh, and, you know, I talk about this even in my books. Uh, is, is there's always multiple explanations for a symbol. And you always get into it with Albert Pike and Manley P. Hall and even people like uh, uh, Albert Mackey where they say, you know, there, there's one explanation that is for the profane masses. This is just what we put out there. But then there are these deeper meanings to it that we keep to ourselves. Um, and this is very true uh, within Masonry. You, you will clearly find deeper meanings to a lot of the ritual symbolism, to their symbols in general. Um, th that to me is irrefutable and that getting into that was again, uh, you know, and, and it goes even to the movies, you know, you know, there's deeper meanings to all this. Uh, so, you know, yeah, absolutely. When, when you, when you're looking into, um, symbolism, you know, always pay it, I would stress, I'll just end on this, always pay attention to context, but don't think you all, you know, just cause you found one explanation. Don't think the well doesn't go deeper. There can be deeper meanings as well. Beautifully said, Robert. I mean, you just blew my mind with all of that because I have been looking at the surface and I don't know why. I mean, such I, I like to think of myself as a deep thinker. I like to think of myself as an, an esoteric thinker, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I haven't been looking beyond the surface of all of this. So it really is dualistic and um, it really goes back to something that we've been talking about for years and years and years, which is the magician's intention. Not saying that this is magic or anything like that, but it's the intention of how the symbols are used. Sheree, I know you wanted to jump in. Well, I just wanted to say that um, what you were saying, Robert, was completely spot on. There are double meanings and sometimes there's triple or even quadruple meanings of different symbols and it all depends on the magician's intent the context in which it is being used um we have a few chatters from youtube that are screaming misogyny or they're you know alluding to the idea that freemasonry is misogynistic in that it doesn't allow women to be to participate in freemasonry and we're and they're kind of relegated to the eastern star and you know kind of told okay well this is your version of freemasonry when when you know there's really no you know real um comparison um at least not on an ancient level like there is in freemasonry um that being said it does seem like a lot of the symbolism that you see in Freemasonry is actually alluding to a divine feminine kind of aspect of this creator, this higher being. Um, what what kind of divine feminine symbolism have you seen in uh, in Freemasonic uh, lore, Freemasonic um, symbolism? Robert. Right, sure, sure. I, I understand the question. Yeah, and the sacred feminine. Uh, well, I'll, I'll let me just backpedal a little bit because I, I want to answer the question. Um, the I will say this: um, the sacred feminine. It is an all male organization. Women cannot join. There is a reason for that, and it is twofold. The sacred feminine does turn up in Freemasonry. It comes in in the third degree ritual. Um, but the the Masonic uh, order, I mean, there are female Masonic orders. The Eastern Star has been to be one of them. Uh, you will find this with a lot of fraternal organization where the se sexes are kept separate. I mean, even, you know, the Shriners, they have a woman's organization. Uh, I believe it's called Daughters of the Nile. Mm -hmm. There's the Wives of the Scottish Rite. Um, and if you get into another fraternal order, order that's it's a, it's a powerful, or at least it was fraternal order known as the Odd Fellows. Um, they have they had a women's order that was actually just as popular as the men's and just as powerful called the Rebecca's. Um, now, now they've kind of faded off. Um, they're still around, but they're not what they what they once were. Mm -hmm. um, masonry is all male for two reasons. A, it's the rules. And B is um, all the rituals revolve around the sun. And the sun is the symbol for the masculine. The moon is the symbol for the feminine. Um, so it's a solar brotherhood. Um, every ritual, everything in masonry involves the sun. Um, so because it's, it's, you know, you know, it's, it's what I would call a secular version of the Jesuits almost. Um, it's, it's every, since everything moves around the sun, including the rituals, um, it, it's for the, it's masculine, not feminine. Uh, there is, um, it, this, there is, uh, what you would call, I guess, incorporation of the sacred feminine. This doesn't come in to the third degree. Um, and, and this kind of ties into, Chris, what, what you know you were asking me about the rituals, um, where the third degree ritual, the Hiram Abif ritual, is a retelling of the Osirian legend in, in Egypt, you know, or comparatively the Christ story, uh, you know, where Hiram, you play Hiram Abif, he's the architect of Solomon's temple. He's murdered, resurrected, where have I heard that before? Um, think Osiris, think Jesus. Um, 
And again, um, you know, here we go with our solar allegories. Uh, he, he's killed uh, by three fellow craft. He's buried west of the temple, symbolizing the setting sun. Uh, King Solomon dispatches 12 fellow crafts, the 12 houses of the Zodiac, to go looking for their solar ruler. Uh, and he's, not ra he's raised on the strong grip of the lion's paw, uh, lion, Leo the lion, the soul house of the sun. So everything involves the sun in Freemasonry. It's a solar brotherhood. Um, the sacred feminine comes in, and again, this is the Eastern Star. Um, and of course, Osiris had his uh, sacred feminine consort, known as Isis, the virgin mother, the virgin consort of uh, Osiris. And of course, when Osiris is killed, he's resurrected, and then he goes off to become sort of the solar god of the underworld. Um, and then he's replaced by a solar avatar, standing known as Horus. If you read Albert, Albert Pike and Albert Mackey and even Manly P. Hall, um, you know, the, when the candidate's rec resurrected, he's now symbolizing Horus. Um, you may have heard the expression that Freemasons are the widow's son. Um, mm -hmm. The widow talking about is Isis, the, the you know, who becomes widowed. At the ah. death of um, and of course, you know, that this is what, what we were talking about with the pentagram, um, the symbol of the sacred feminine. Um, the symbol, and you can read Albert Pike, and, and, you know, even I talk about this, the symbol for Sirius is the pentagram. And of course, Sirius was the, the star of Isis. And when the candidate is um, brought back to life when he's raised, um, he, he meets the brother on what is known as the five points of fellowship. And of course, the five points are Sirius. And he has a word whispered in his ear, um, and this ties into the whole royal arch, arch ritual. Hiram Abiff possesses something known as the, you know, the, the lost word of the Master Mason. It's lost upon his death. The secret word is the name of God. It's what's known as the Tetragrammaton. So when he's he gets killed, the word is lost, and when he gets raised to the five points of fellowship, uh, the, the, uh, he has a substitute word whis whispered in his ear. I can't tell you what that word is. The true word, the true name is recovered in the high degrees in the Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial, but he's, he has this word whispered in his ear on the five points, and the five points are a reference to Sirius the Virgin Mother. Well, why is that? Well, Isis had a secret name of deity, uh, the secret name of Amun-Ra, uh, the spiritual sun god, which she used to resurrect Osiris, uh, and 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 birth and, and through this resurrection, through the secret name, uh, she resurrects Osiris and then births his solar stand-in, his solar heir Horus. Um, so all this is referencing this whole Masonic ritual is referencing the sun, the Osirian cycle, and the whole idea of the five points of fellowship, the secret name, the substitute name. This is a reference to the sacred feminine. In the Egyptian mythology, this would be Isis, the Virgin Mother. Of course, in Christianity, this is the Virgin Mary. So this is all studying comparative symbolism, comparative ritual. Um, but to, to just answer the question twofold, it's all men. It's all men because it's uh, it's it, it revolves around the sun. But we do include the sacred feminine in the way of Isis, the Virgin Mother. Uh, so there you have it. And that's not meant to denigrate the female in any way. It's meant to to keep them separate to a certain extent so that um, the alchemy is more pure. It, it does seem to me like there, when you have a, a coven of witches, for example, back in the, let's just say, the 17th century, you've got a coven of witches, they work well together with no men involved even back in the native american cultures the women would would exclude the men from the moon lodges every month the women would go into the moon lodge and they would do rituals they would do um magical things in there and would make decisions on behalf of the rest of the tribe during those those times and men weren't allowed so it does make sense sometimes to separate the sexes for a time in order for spiritual growth and those kinds of things to to go on on a collective level. So I understand that completely. Um, I do think that you're completely spot on about the about the ISIS symbolism as well. The um, the Statue of Liberty was a Freemasonic uh, statue that was I think it was gifted to the U.S. from France. Um, for our help in some kind of, I think it was a war that, that we fought with them. But the point being that it was supposed to be Isis, the goddess Isis. Um, I, don't, I think we might have talked about this in a show before, and you, you claimed that it wasn't a Freemasonic statue, or maybe that was someone else. Was that you, Robert? 
No, it is. It is a Masonic uh, statue, and it has incorporation of the se- sacred feminine. Obviously, you can look at it as Isis. Um, it's 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 a gift from the uh, Grand Orient of France uh, to the Freemasons of the United States, uh, as it says on the plaque um, inside the base. And it it uh, it 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 it's um, you know esoteric. I mean, it faces east to again idolize the rising sun. Um, it was originally a gift to Egypt. It was a gift for America from France, I believe, on our centennial. Um, and it's it's low, overloaded with uh, Masonic symbolism. It sits in New York Harbor, and New York is the birthplace of the York Rite. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it, it, the 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 the, um, the Statue of Liberty is replete with the number seven. Uh, the seventh degree in the York Rite is the Royal Arch of Enoch, the recovery of the Tetragrammaton. Um, you are dealing with elements of again Egyptian mythology. Um, the, you know, the, the whole, the whole, um, number seven, it has seven points, seven rays coming out of her head. Um, the, the goddess of geometry and, and, uh, in, in Egypt, the, the wisdom goddess is a character known as Thoth and he is a female, um, com, com, you know, equal and her name is Sashat and she is actually known as she of seven points. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll find the seven rays and it's, it's sort of a reference. She's the goddess of geometry mm-hmm. in Egypt. And, she was the uh, one that would lay the cord. She was the she laying was, of the cord ceremony. Yeah, and the only one that was a scribe, only one ever pictured. The only woman. Yeah, only ever woman pictured, ever pictured with uh, with a writing. Right. Yeah, yeah, with writing and, tools. And you will you will find, um, and it's interesting because it, this whole ties into the royal arch ceremonial and even the fellow craft degree in the blue lodge where you encourage the seven study the seven liberal arts and sciences. Uh, they, they are restored the seven liberal arts and sciences in the in the royal arch ceremonial. So if, if you read the book, if you read the royal arch of Enoch. Um, you're going to see these nexuses, these Masonic links to things like the Statue of Liberty and the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. Um, and, you know, we talk about things in the book, you know, such as things people don't even realize that were Masonic undertakings. I mean, it's common knowledge now, things like, you know, the Washington, D.C. template, streetscape, uh, things like that, um, you know, in the Statue of Liberty. But some of the things people may not be aware of, which are fascinating, are like the Royal Arch, uh, Gateway Arch. To St. Louis and the Erie Canal and uh, Union College of Schenectady, New York. Uh, those are all f- fascinating. Uh, in Baltimore, where I am, uh, we have Masonic architecture that's actually paralleling the architecture in Washington, D.C. That's an interesting study. Um, some of the state seals and logos. So I, I, I wrote Royal Arch of Enoch to connect all these dots and sort of bring all these all, all the Masonic symbolism together. I mean, and you're right, you know, I mean, I'm just sort of scratching the surface with it, kind of giving you uh, surface answers. It's a lot more in depth. We, you know, I, I could go on for this for hours. Well, but, let me um, jump in yeah, before yeah. before we move on too far. Sure. On sure. the screen, I have Toth and Seishat. You can see the seven points around her head. Some would say that that represents the papyrus leaf um, because she was a scribe. And what's interesting is she's in front of the acacia tree, mm-hmm. and the acacia is so revered in Egypt. And I, I think there's actually a degree called the sprig of acacia, if I remember. It's a correctly. ritual, actually. Well, it's 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 in it's in the ritual. It's in the third degree ritual. Um, it's a solar reference again. It's a um, in in the in the third degree ritual. Hermabit's body is buried west of the temple and his grave is concealed with a sprig of acacia and the sprig of acacia is a flower sacred to the sun god apollo um so again it's another uh solar you know allegory solar reference there within the blue lodge which which is all all the sun um everything in the blue lodge is a solar reference from pretty much start to finish fascinating um you're really bringing a whole new perspective to the table here, Robert. I, I've heard you talk about these things before, but I've never listened with so much depth as I am this evening, and I'm getting a completely new meaning from from everything. So um, you graduate from a master mason, you go into the higher realms of masonry, and um, let's say you choose to go down the path of the Scottish Rite. So what is the process from that point? Right. Okay. So if you're if you're um, if you're in the Blue Lodge and you 
you're a master mason, you've done the third degree, you've passed the catechism, you now have um, two, two, degree, two high degree bodies, the two premier ones open to you to choose if you want to do them. It's completely, operate, it's completely um, up to you. So let's say you're interested in doing the Scottish Rite. Um, the way that would work is very similar to the Blue Lodge. Um, you would find a brother in the lodge, which shouldn't be too hard, who has done the Scottish Rite, and you ask them for a petition uh, to join. Um, at which point they will oblige you and get you one. Alternatively, if you can't find someone in the lodge who hasn't done the Scottish Rite, which is probably rare, um, you could go to your local valley um, and, and just, just kind of knock on the door, give them a phone call and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Freemason in so-and-so lodge. Um, I'm in good state. You got to be in good standing, which means you have to be up to date with your payments, with your lodge membership. Um, and they'll, they'll probably just hand you an application or mail you one, say, fine. Um, and then you get an application and you fill it out. Um, you certify or you affirm that you're in good standing with your lodge. You cut them a check. Um, and they, they, they need, um, but you'll, you'll, you'll fill it out. You'll send the check in and you, you will get, um, you know, invited to join the Scottish Rite. Um, the, the lot, the rituals usually take, they usually do different rituals on different nights. It's not all done on one night. You can do that if you want to. Um, some rituals are very fast. Um, some rituals are more drawn out. Um, I can't remember, um, you know, at all of them at this point in time. The one that I focused on, probably the most um, important one in degrees four through 32 is the 13th in the Scottish Rite. It's the Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial. Um, that's really the end of the story. Um, what a lot of people aren't aware of is, you know, you hear the 32nd degree is the highest. That's true numerically. Um, a lot of the rituals in the Scottish, right? So you go in and it's, you do, it's degrees four through four through um, 14. That's what's known as the Lodge of Perfection. Um, and, and its reason is because the 13th is where you recover the name of, of, uh, of, of, of God. This is the lost word of Hiram Abiff. This is what's lost when he gets murdered. Um, you, and when, when you get raised in the Blue Lodge, like I said, you get a substitute word whispered in your ear. When you go through the Scottish Rite and the York Rite, um, this is where the real name is found. And again, I would just stress that this is ceremonial. No Mason believes that this is actually the real name of God. It's completely ceremonial. Um, but anyway, it's where this word is recovered. And then you go into um, different, uh, you, then you keep continuing with the rituals. But a lot of the rituals at that play, to, point take place prior to the Royal Arch ceremonial. So you actually go back in time. Um, the degree structure is somewhat out of order. Um, so it's really the 13th, 14th degree is where kind of the story ends. Um, but then, you know, the highest degree, you know, numerically is the 32nd. Um, that's where it ends numerically. You can't go any higher. Uh, the 33rd degree is the last is the last uh, degree. Um, that's invitation only. You cannot solicit that. You have to be invited uh, to, 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 to participate in the 33rd degree or be invited to the 33rd degree. That is um, invited. That is invitation only. You can't solicit it. Um, so it's up to them uh, who they admit in. Uh, to the 33rd degree. Right. So to answer some of the questions going on in the in the chat room at the beginning of the show, why aren't you a 33rd degree? It's um, a, a degree that is bestowed upon a person and it's usually bestowed upon a person after years and years and years, decades of, um, mace, uh, of being a Freemason. And it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but one of the key responsibilities of a 33rd degree is to maintain masonry so in the event that uh, there's not a lodge in an area or something happens and a, the 33rd degrees act as a continuity of masonry yeah that sounds right to me um i'm not in it um so but i'll take your word for that um but you know i'm not in the 33rd so um until i get there if I ever do, I wouldn't want to um, speak to its inner goings on. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's invitation only. And if, if, if I'm a you know, if the Valley, if the Valley is putting that out um, on their webpage or something, and it's an official webpage. Yeah, then that's fine. I'll take the word for it, but um, I'm not going to speak to what they're going on or since I've, I've never joined it. Okay. Um, it's just, some, that sounds right. I it, mean, that sounds like, yeah, it, it's, it's something, it, it's something that I read um, yeah. somewhere. So, um, but it sound it felt right. It felt like, yeah. okay. Oh, yeah. And then maybe there's like devil horns under the yarmulkes too. I don't know. <laughs> that's what the conspiracy theories would say. Um, but it, I'm glad that we were able to clear up a lot of these conspiracy theories. And one of the biggest conspiracy theories is that there's more degrees beyond the 33rd, that it all goes up to 95, 99, 180 degrees. 
degrees, et cetera, et cetera, which I have found no evidence for. So maybe we can clear that up right on the other side. And um, we can take some listener questions as well and get into some of the more esoteric meanings and um, symbolism in masonry. Really, really refreshing broadcast. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go anywhere. Phase two complete. Preparing to initiate phase three momentarily. Brace yourself, traveler. We are about to venture into the realms of the unknown. www.beyondthebailradio.com You are listening to Beyond the Veil with Chris and Sherry Geo. Geo. On iHeartRadio. T minus 60 seconds and counting. Welcome, fellow traveler, to phase three of this journey. Here you will experience an even deeper level of understanding as we traverse through the boundaries of hyperspace consciousness. Here, you will find that reality is altered with a single thought and a single intention. Set your intention now and prepare to travel deeper. Deeper, deeper, deeper. Beyond the veil. Ah, it feels so good to be back. I'm so glad that we were able to do a show this evening, especially with Robert W. Sullivan IV. Um, Whole new perspective that we are hearing and seeing because we took the truth or goggles off, we took the conspiracy theory goggles off and just started seeing things for what they are. But it gets even more interesting when you do that because instead of being bound to the truth or conspiratorial viewpoint, now you're seeing in multi-dimensions when it comes to the symbolism. And you're seeing above, below, left, right, 180 degrees, 360 degrees. And uh, one of the big conspiracies out there is that there are more degrees beyond the 33rd and that it just gets higher and higher and higher and higher. Um, I don't find that to be true at all. Have you heard anything like that, Robert? And can you confirm if there are higher degrees out there? Uh, well, there used to be. Uh, there, there used to be. There, there were, I know what you're referring to. It's what's called the rights of Memphis Miserium. Uh, ah. and- and 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 they 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 they, they were out there. Um, this is a phenomenon of the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, they, they are defunct. Uh, they they have they have not been around for some time. Um, if if a person or a group is performing them, this is what is in masonry known as clandestine masonry. Um, and and you will get this when you go through the rituals. Um, one of the things you will swear to. Um, as your oath of allegiance is, you will swear to never sit in a lodge of clandestine masons. Um, and what that is, is what, 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 what a group of clandestine masons is, is a group of masons who are acting um, or are a part of something of, or an organization that is not necessarily um, rec- that is holding itself as Freemasonry, but has been, not been recognized by the state Grand Lodge as a Masonic body. Um, now, it doesn't mean you can't join other fraternal organizations. You can do that. Um, I mean, you certainly join like think groups like the Odd Fellows or something like that. But you, you can't join a group that is holding itself out as masonry, which has not been recognized as Masonic. Um, so when you go, you, you know, when, when you when you go through the Blue Lodge, you can join Masonic bodies, you know, that have been recognized, such as the Scottish Rite, the York Rite, and these other groups like the Shriners, Yed's Grotto, Tall Cedars, um, you know, or groups that are fraternal. Um, but are not necessarily related to masonry, like the Odd Fellows. But if, if it's a group of masons performing rituals um, unrecognized by the Grand Lodge, that's called clandestine masonry, and you're not supposed to join that. Those degrees aren't recognized. Um, and if you join, you can get if it gets back to them, you can get booted out. Uh, you can get into trouble with it. And, and if you have a question, um, they'll answer it. If you say, hey, look, I got invited to join this group, um, you know, that's calling itself masonry, is it or, you know, or is this going to be problematic? They'll, they'll look into it. Um, and, and tell you, oh, you know, you're okay with that, or say, 
you know, no, 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 that's, that's, you know, we, we don't recognize that stay away from it. Um, so they will help you out with that. But the high, the, 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 any degrees beyond the Scottish right, um, this would be clandestine. This would not be recognized. Certainly, you know, if people want to do them or, you know, you know, create a website or something, um, they certainly can. But this isn't going to be recognized by any state Grand Lodge. And, and this would fall under the umbrella of what is known as clandestine information. Ah, thank you very much for clearing that up. On the other side, I do want to talk about some symbolism. I want to talk about the square and compass. Mm -hmm. I also want to talk about the most, um, what's the term I'm looking at? Infamous, infamous symbol of all, the pyramid and the eye. We'll get into that with Robert W. Sullivan, the fourth right here on Beyond the Veil. Traveler, remember this. Whatever plane our consciousness may be acting in, both we and the things belonging to the plane are, for the time being, our only realities. However, if we mistake the shadows for realities, we find ourselves confusing the upward progress of the ego as an elevation of consciousness. Thus, beware of oneself when you step beyond the veil. Right, jumping into hour number three with Robert W. Sullivan. Um, I want to talk about the pyramid in the eye, the square and compass, et cetera, et cetera, in this hour. But uh, I do want to ask a question that somebody asked in the chat room. And hello to everybody in the chat room. We've got Coco, Chris Steiner, uh, Dr. Kayak, um, Daryl, Drone Free Zone, Galactic Pixie, Illumin Kenati, uh, Comet Man, Progeny of, of Light, Redempty, um, Regular Girl, um, Undone, Undaunt, uh, Marco M, Tracy, uh, so many, so many more. Uh, that's on TFR. We've got everybody on Facebook. Are you going to do the Facebook? Yep. Marcus okay. Aurelius, Demetrius Golden, Cameron St. John, Carmela Kerr. Uh, let's see who else. Pitcher, G Pitcher Gia. Carrie Wentworth Niesel, er, Herb Anthony, uh, and I think that's it for Facebook because I had to reload. Oh, so, okay. Um, and everybody else on Facebook. Everybody else on and Facebook. And of course, we've got Patricia Shepard, um, Super Breadhead David, Dusty Aftu, um, Strange Dot Machine, um, Jeremiah Shoemaker, Patricia Shepard. Progeny of Light, and uh, the list goes on and on and yes, on on it, it would be YouTube <laughs> as well. So uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Now, um, Strange Dot Machine on YouTube asked a question um, that I, I think is a great question. What does the 33rd mean? Because people have attributed so many different meanings to it, the 33rd degree parallel and so on and so forth. Anytime they see 33, they go, oh, that's a sign right there. We have a slider up on our website, and uh, up until last week, it said, um, choose from over 33 on-air personalities, and, uh, you know, the, the naysayer, oh, look, 33, it's right there. We just added another show, so the slider says choose from 34 on-air personalities uh -huh. now, but people look at that 33rd, and, or the 33, and go, oh, it's it's got to be, conspiracy. it's got to be meaning something. <laughs> Is there another meaning besides the level of the degree? Well, right. It's it's the 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 number three within masonry is very important. You have the three degrees, of course, thirty third the Scottish right. Um, it has to do with Hebrew Kabbalah. Um, it's Kabbalistic. Um, you have uh, twenty two paths of Hebrew Kabbalah, and you have ten sephiron. Um, it's an emanation of divinity. Um, so you have uh, twenty two plus ten is thirty two, and then you have a hidden. When when you put all the sephiron together, you have a hidden sephiron known as Doth or dot. 
um, and that's your spiritual godhead uh, within within the Kabbalistic tree. So the whole thirty three the, the, the um, whole thirty third degree system is an emanation of uh, Hebrew Kabbalah, um, or even what you would call in the Renaissance maybe even Christian Kabbalah. Um, that that to me seems to be its most probably well known esoteric uh, interpretation as to why there are what, what why there are thirty three degrees. Okay, excellent. So I want to direct listeners' attention to this symbol here that I have on the screen. It's the all-seeing eye of providence. And you see it in several different contexts. You see it um, in uh, its, you know, just by itself. You see it on the back of the dollar bill. You see it as the capstone of the pyramid. But what I found most intriguing is that you also find it on several churches and the Christians seem to be very very against masonry they believe masonry is uh, satanic etc cetera, etc cetera. yet you go to so many Christian churches and you find the symbol up at the top of the stained glass windows I remember at my mother's funeral at the Greek Orthodox Church I was bumping Sheree on the shoulder and look there's a pyramid and an eye right there so I do a little bit of research and I find out that this originated as a Christian symbol at some point it seemed that masonry had taken this on maybe it was uh, around the era of the Knights Templar who were very religious based and um, I was speaking to a Templar on Facebook and he said you know the reason they took the oath to uh, uphold Jesus Christ was against the Crusades and the Muslim um, fighting that was taking place back then so I don't know how much truth there is to that um, but it seems to be inherently a Christian symbol or am I wrong about that well it's it's again yeah I mean it's 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 just an, a symbol well, what the all-seeing eye represents and why they like it in masonry, it's a, it's a symbol for deity. Um, the eye of providence, you know, comparatively the eye of Horus um, in your Egyptian, uh, you know, pantheon. But it's an eye for deity. Um, it's an eye for the, you know, it's a symbol of deity and not the eye of deity. It's the eye of providence. It's a symbol for deity, a symbol for the supreme being. And of course, why, why this masonry likes to use that symbol so much is because masonry is theistic. Um, it requires belief in a supreme being, but it doesn't ascribe, you know, you can be a Christian and join, you can be Jewish and join, you can be a Muslim and join. So if you call the supreme being Allah, or you call him Jehovah or Yahweh, um, it all fits. It's, it's just a symbol. It's just a, a symbol for deity. Whatever you ascribe to it is up to you, up to the individual Mason. So that's why it's so popular in Masonry. And my goodness gracious, I mean, you'll find that symbol all over Masonic lodges. You'll find it on aprons. You'll find it on Masonic documents. Um, I mean, when it comes to Freemasonry, yeah, I mean, it's everywhere. And I should point out, you know, Masonry does incorporate a lot of you know, Judaic, Christian, even Islamic uh, symbolism. Um, you know, I mean, the, the whole ritual revolves around the building of Solomon's temple. I mean, you have the killed and resurrection motif symbolism, you know, of Jesus, of, of Osiris. Um, you have um, the Blue Lodge. Um, the, the, the philosophy of the Blue Lodge uh, really represents um, uh, what is known as mystical Islam, which is called Sufism. Uh, you will find numerous uh, components of mystical Islam, Sufism, in Freemasonry. So Masonry, and this is why it's such a great topic, um, and, and why it's it's so interesting, because it, it draws together so many different assets, uh, aspects, excuse me, and um, philosophies of life. I mean, it incorporates Christianity, Judaism, Islam, the mystery schools, e Egyptian symbolism, architecture, sacred geometry, the occult mysticism. Um, I mean, it really is a, a, a you know a smorgasbord um, to piece out. And I mean, my goodness, you know, you get into the history of it. I mean, you're dealing with the Templars and the, you know you know nation building and the symbols in the United States. I mean, it's a vast. Uh, study it, but it, to me, at any rate, uh, Chris, it's why it's so fascinating, and uh, why I wrote a 700-page uh, book about it. Fantastic! That's the um, the Royal Arch book. Mm -hmm. Where can people pick that up? Yeah, the Royal Arch of Enoch. That was my first book. Um, that is available right now on all major online retailers. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes and Noble. You can get it on Books a Million. If you are listening overseas, you will find it on the you know the Amazon equivalent, you know Amazon Canada or Amazon in England or Amazon in Australia. Um, there, there are other uh, sites that carry it as well, such as Waterstones, Blackwells. Those are overseas sites. Um, you can get the, you get the print copy. Um, that's a little bit more money, um, but you can get the ebook. 
uh, for $9.99. And again, that is available in all formats. You can get it on Amazon Kindle. Um, all my books are, are this way. You can get it on Barnes & Noble Nook. There are EPUB versions out there. I've actually found it as cheap as $7.99 on places like eBook Mall, Kobo. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, my books are, you know, in Royal Archer of Enoch is, is readily available. Um, if, if, if the easy, one of the easy way to get it is just go to my website, as you mentioned in the first hour. Uh, my website is my name. My name is Robert W. Sullivan IV. So my website is www.robertwsullivaniv.com. Links to buy the books, again, in print and ebook form. Uh, information about me, information about events and appearances, including this one, that's there. My links to my social media. So, yeah, it's available on all major online retailers. You really should have no problem finding it. Fantastic. Um, so I do want to get to the – I hope I'm not jumping too far ahead – um, but the the square and the compass, um, which is obviously the the Freemasonic symbol, it's the one that everybody identifies. It uh, also has the G in the middle, and sometimes sure. it's seen with the I as well in the middle sure. instead. So, sure. um, can you go into that briefly? Right, right. Um, the, the, there are esoteric explanations with this. Um, the, you know, the, the, that's a little more complex, and you probably should read the book for um, the tool. The, 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 those are two. You know, when, when you're dealing with masonry, you're dealing with architecture um, and actual building. Um, you, when, when you join masonry, you will hear the terms operative mason and speculative mason. An operative mason is an actual civil engineer. Um, so we incorporate the tools of civil engineering, such as the square and compasses. Um, the speculative mason, these are people like doctors, lawyers, um, people who may not be involved in civil engineering, but wanted the, you know, the occult secrets of masonry. So join the Masonic Lodge. This would be a person like myself. Um you know, who, who joined. And again, when you're dealing with Masonic symbolism, you're dealing with multiple levels of symbolism with the square and compasses. These are, of course, construction tools, um, you know, you know, you know, a square and a compass used for measuring um, in, in, in masonry. You'll hear them as squaring our actions um, and, and things like that, that you always want to be on the level. You want to always act, you know, forthright and proper. Um, these are Masonic teachings that you will get when you join the degree. Um, and you're absolutely correct. Um, a lot of times this is accompanied by the letter G or the all-seeing eye. Um, the all-seeing eye usually, um, this is more of a European thing um, with the all-seeing eye. When, when you had the birth of the United States and they wanted to distance themselves from England after the revolution, the all-seeing eye was dropped from inside the square compasses and was replaced by the letter G. Although I kind of like the all seeing eye personally a little bit better, but no matter. Um, the letter G is generally accepted, um, and I see no reason to disagree with this, to stand for one of two things or both. Um, it's either God or geometry or both. Um, that is my understanding of it. I really never encountered anything. Um, other than that, some people will say it stands for Gnosticism. I think that's a stretch. Uh, I, you know, you know, in my, my, in my experience, it's either been standing for God or geometry. And of course, that makes total sense. So, yeah, I mean, when you see the square and compasses, especially in the United States, you will almost always see the letter G in the middle representing God and geometry. God and geometry. Um, I've heard that it, it stands for the great architect or the grand architect. Right, right. Um, well, that that's a name for deity in um, the lodge is the grand archi great architect of the universe. Again, this is drawing on measurement that the the idea that the the god god is you know a, a sublime like a mason you know a builder. Um, so the letter you know again I, I've I've always understood the letter G to be god or geometry. The title what you'll hear um, in masonry when you join. You know, you, you won't hear the word God thrown around or you won't hear the word supreme being thrown around when the worshipful master is giving his lecture, you know, and refers to deity. Um, you, you will occasionally hear the word God from time to time. I take that back. Um, but usually the, the, the God, the God figure is referred to as the great architect of the universe. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and you, you will find that as you go through the lodge degree system. Okay. Um, have a couple of great listener questions here. Sheree, I know you, sure. you're looking like you want to jump in. Is there anything you wanted to address? No, I just wanted to jump in with listener questions. Oh, okay. Um, David asked a really good question. What are the basic moral tenets of masonry? Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, you know, to, to teach you to be a upright person, to act 
Um, I mean, I, you, you get this in the, in the lectures, uh, you know, the actual language that's used um, to be, you know, I, I can't read just off the top of my head. It's late here in Baltimore uh, where I am. Um, I can't remember the, the, the actual terms that are used, but essentially it's to teach you to be an upright, forthright person, um, to be honorable, to be noble. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what masonry is teaching you to do, um, to just be an honest and, and noble person and to, uh, to, to act accordingly. Um, I heard the motto is, um, making good men better or something like that. Sure. That's, that's a Masonic motto. Um, you will hear masonry makes good men better. Um, it teaches you to, you know, be truthful, to be upright. Um, there, 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 are, there, are, there is a language with this that is in the degree system where you're lectured on this. Um, it's escaping me right now, but it, it's there. I'm just, and I'm just encapsulating for time constraints. But in a nutshell, th those are basically the tenets of Freemasonry, what it's trying to impart to you, you know, I, I, as the question was asked, to just be an upright and forthright and decent person. Well said. Um, another great question from Strange Dot Machine. Um, why is the 33rd degree always said to be the sat the satanic worshiping degree is this pure truther quote unquote everyone i don't like is a satanist nonsense well yeah i mean this is you know the the idea is because it's a secret degree and because you have to be invited this is the the level that alleges where all the puppet masters belong to um and you know i guess in in a lot of these these guys are evil or whatever um i've been involved with the scottish right since 1999 so that's been almost well, I got involved with it in October 1999. So it's been 18 years. I've been in the Blue Lodge for 20 over 20 years now. Um, I have never in my all my time in masonry seen anything satanic or evil or anything like that, or that would give me trepidation to join or or recommend someone to join. Um, you know, I, I suspect. You know, I mean, a lot of this comes from the world of conspiracy, you know, where, you know, again, you can blame Albert Pike, where he talks about Lucifer and morals and dogma, um, equating it to the planet Venus. A lot of conspiracy people who don't like masonry picked up on this. One of the one of the prime hoaxers of this was a man in the 19th century known as Leo Taxel. Um, and he wrote a, a treatise called The Secrets of Freemasonry, where he alleged masonry was satanic. He later uh, came out and said this was a hoax. Um, and, and, but, but it, it stuck, it stuck, it hung in there. A man named William Guy Carr in, in the 19th century, um, wrote books such as, I think it's Pawns of the Game and another one called The Devil, you know, The World Belongs to Satan. Again, picking up on the tax all hoax, saying masonry was all satanic. Um, well, he, it was, it was Carr that, um, took, uh, that completely fabricated that Albert Pike quote right, about right. the third world war. And, right. um, then another person plagiarized that and then added Islam and Zionism, et cetera, like completely revamped it. But the quote was completely fabricated. And this was one of the first red flags to me, like, Hey, wait a minute. I've always taken this as conspiracy fact. I looked beyond the veil and I said, Hey, I better read what this guy, Albert Pike actually said, rather than just taking these memes on Facebook at face value. Right. I mean, I mean, the, the, the whole letter from Albert Pike to Giuseppe Banzini about three world wars is a fiction. Uh, it doesn't exist. Um, it is made up from start to finish. Um, Pike um, is an interesting character. Um, he is grand sovereign commander of the Scottish right from 1859 to his death in 1891. Morals and Dogma is published in 1871. Um, he borrows heavily from the works of a French magician named Alaphis Levy. Um, and uh, a, a lot of the material from Levy you'll find in Pike. Um, that's irrefutable. Um, Pike was also an odd fellow. Um, he was a member of another secret group called the Odd Fellows, um, and he was actually an odd fellow before he became a Freemason. Um, and yeah, I mean, he's an interesting character. He's what's known as a Copperhead. Um, these were Northern Democrats who supported the South during the Civil War. Um, he fights for the Confederacy. Um, he is a Northerner, uh, and because he of his Northern affiliation. Um, he never, you know, he, he's important. He, he fights for the South, but he never obtains any sort of um, massive uh, rank or anything within the South. He is not the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. He had nothing to do with the Ku Klux Klan. This is total fabrication. Um, this is made up. Um, you, if, if you want to stretch it um, and suggest 
that you know the first the first grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan was a Confederate general named Nathan Bedford Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest would have been known to Albert Pike. They probably were friends. Um, is it possible that maybe Forrest had Pike look at the KKK rituals just to get his input on them? Yeah, that's possible. Um, that's not you know um, etched in stone. That's just me speculating. Um, would I be surprised if I had discovered that? No, probably not. Um, but Pike is not in the Ku Klux Klan. He never founded it. Um, he was never a member of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, but he writes the book Morals and Dogma, where he talks about Lucifer. Pike was a bit of a showman. Uh, he had the P.T. Barnum gene, let's say. And Pike knew what he was doing. I mean, he wrote it. If he knew if he wrote, is it Venus that heralds the sunrise? Well, no one would care about that. Um, but if he writes, you know, is it Lucifer that brings the light? Oh, well, here, you know, this is going to cause controversy and have people talking about this hundreds of years after I'm gone. And sure enough, he's right, because here we are still talking about Albert Pike. And I'm probably guilty of it, too, because I talk about it in my book as well. So, um, you know, when, when you hear Lucifer in Freemasonry, this all goes back to Pike. And, and all, all, you know, and I'll stretch this again as well, um, you know, or I'll say this again. Um, if you ever read Morals and Dogmen, I, I recommend people to read it. Um, it's an interesting book anyway. Um, it's really not a book about Freemasonry. It's about, a book about comparative symbolism and religion. In fact, it's often credited as being the first book on comparative religion published in the United States. So to find this Lucifer um, comparison is, is not alarming or, or, or shouldn't even be surprising that he's comparing Lucifer to the planet Venus when the whole book is about comparative symbolism, comparative religion, comparative mythology. Uh, it's an interesting book. I, I rely on it constantly um, in, in my work, in my research. So um, by all means, check it out. Uh, you know, it's an interesting book. Fantastic. Um, Sheree, you wanted to jump in? Yes. Mrs. Gia? Yes, definitely. <laughs> um Strange Dot Machine said, this is all great and entertaining, but is this really bringing anyone closer to truth, to raw consciousness? It's a lot of stuff, lots and lots of labels and stories. I think that this is definitely important because at the at the heart of everything is the symbolism has all these different meanings. And when you get to the bottom of these meanings, there is the raw consciousness staring you right in the face. And it's not about all the rituals and it's not even about all the people that you're working with. And it's not about all the people that are Masons. They're not doing it because the Masons are doing it. They're doing it because it's an individual thing. It's an individual journey that they're walking and they're being guided down. Well, I would go so far as to say that, I mean, at least from what I understand and what I hear, Masonry is essentially the the continuation of the Egyptian mystery schools. Exactly. What do you think about that, Robert? Oh, I agree. It, it is. It, it incorporates loads of mystery school uh, components of that. It's important because the symbolism of masonry, at least I believe it's important. I mean, I wrote a 700 page book about it is, you know, is, is when you become familiar with the symbolism, you will really understand why you know, the cornerstone of the Supreme Court was laid on October 13th. That's done intentionally, um, you know, and you will understand why Hermes, Trismegistus and Hermes is always hanging around its symbols outside the library um, or why, you know, why, why if you walk into um, Christchurch at Oxford University and you walk into the Tom Quad at Christchurch, well, you won't, the last thing you're going to find is Christian symbols. You're going to find a fountain there with Hermes Trismegistus in it. That's right. um, you want to know why, you know, the part of the Thames River that runs by Oxford University is renamed the River Isis. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a reason for that. why the Capitol building has a dome on it, why the Bodleian Library in Oxford has a dome on it. These all have reasons uh, for it. Um, and they are very occult in nature and they all lie in esoteric Freemasonry. So for me, it is consciousness expansion. I think it's a fascinating study as to why these, these how this architecture and how the symbolism is being used and, um, and employed. And like I said, it's all contextual. When you discover the context, oh, you'll see, OK, now I understand why. You know, the cornerstone of this building was laid on this date. Mm -hmm. And, and it, this, time, this ties into the, the movies as well. My other two books, you know, you'll understand why when you want, you know, and it is it ties into consciousness expansion, divine spark ignition. Um, you know, you'll understand why in, you know, Black Swan, the poster has the date of February 12th on it or why Chris McNeil and the Exorcist says there's 88 doctors here. Um, this is all very well placed. And when you understand the symbolism and you understand the mythology and, you know, but beneath all this, it helps fill it in. I guess. 
Very well said. Uh, hold right there, Robert. Let's take a quick break. But um, it seems like it's about consciousness. It's mm-hmm. about rebalancing the consciousness. It's about um, balancing the masculine and the feminine. During the break, I'm going to play this clip that Ron Patton actually posted on Facebook earlier. So don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We will be right back. Let's talk about what's real. I became a Freemason because I was obsessed with understanding what death was at a very young age. It encourages the initiate to be comfortable with the fact that we are not immortal. So how are you going to live your life in the time that you're here? If you are going to know yourself, then you've got to ask these questions. The fundamental message of Masonry is man's pursuit of communion with his Creator. It was very much this out-of-body experience. I learned secrecy of the inner self. It's a time outside of time. You're in another world. The principles of Freemasonry are eternal. Satan gave me this message. Hello, YouTube. I hope you're well. Spotlight is on Chris Cheer, Cheer, Cheer. So, Chris Geo openly promotes the use of the goddess tarot. tarot. <laughs> so he pushes the divine feminine. The divine feminine. The divine feminine. You call it Isis or whatever, Sophia. Where does, Where does the fire, fire come, come from, from Chris? Chris? Where does the fire come from? Now go to 1 Corinthians 14. God says it's a shame for women to speak. Fire, fire in the minds, in the minds, of, minds of men. Of men. He's okay. silent. So he pushes the divine feminine. The divine feminine. The divine feminine. <laughs> See the cross of the Lord. Begone you hostile power. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. Everything that is, was, and will be, eternally is, even the countless forms which are finite and perishable only in their objective, and not in their ideal form. The form which manifests itself beyond the veil. All right, we are back. And final segment, unfortunately, with Robert W. Sullivan IV, but it's going to be a long segment, 30 minutes. So uh, we'll get into it. Um, Cosmic morality asked a really, really good question. Um, Robert... According to Freemasonry, or maybe going through the thirty, the thirty-two degrees that you have, maybe you can speak uh, on a personal level, or maybe on a level of the entire organizational belief. But I have a feeling that once you get to those higher realms, and it becomes more of an individualized path than an organizational path. Um, but what is the view of death? Well, I, I, the you know, again, it's like you said, it's it's an individual thing. The, the, what I listened to what you were playing there during the commercial break, and I tend, to, yeah, I mean, that's right on. I mean, the whole idea with masonry is, you know, you're here for a short amount of time. Um, in in the York, right, you you get into the whole chamber of reflection where you you know contemplate your existence in front of a skull, and you're encouraged to write your last will and testament. So, the whole idea of masonry is, you know, it's preparing you you know, to be forthright, to be this better person so that when you die, you know, there is this belief in a supreme being. Uh, you, you will hear constantly when, when you become a Mason um, and you get your little newsletter, you will constantly get, you know, um, or not constantly, but you'll get, um, you know, a list of people who have passed on um, in the last couple months, brothers in your lodge. And the, and the term that's always right used is raised to the celestial lodge above. Um, so there is a belief in an afterlife. Um, there is clearly a belief in a supreme being. Um, and the idea is that, 
you know, death comes for everyone and that no matter what your station, and this, this, this ties into what masonry teaches is that you meet on the level you meet as equals, um, because no matter how much money you have or how famous you are or how, you know, or if you don't have any money, um, you're all equals within the lodge. Um, you know, the King of England can sit next to, um, someone who collects money at a, uh, train station. Um, you're all equals in the lodge and you're all going to be gone anyway. Um, you know, you know, death comes to everybody. So treat everybody equally and know that you're not better than anybody because, you know, you're all going to that great uh, celestial lodge one day. So, yeah, I mean, that this is sort of a general teaching within Masonry. Um, and, you know, you know, what I heard during the commercial break, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with what was being said there. Excellent. Excellent. Um, that was posted by Ron Patton, who is the producer for Clyde Lewis. I don't know if you've ever been on Clyde's show before, but huge, huge show, multiple yeah. uh, affiliates. And I passed him your name and I said, you have to contact this guy, especially if you're interested in masonry. So um, hopefully he'll be reaching out to you very soon uh, because this kind of information needs to get out there to the masses, to um, whoever is receptive to it. But then again, it's kind of a double edged sword, what you're doing, in my opinion. Robert, because um, on one hand, I feel that a lot of this gnosis, a lot of this knowledge, it's hidden for a reason, not only to keep it away from the church, for example, because the church was going around and suppressing all of this knowledge, um, but ultimately because when you have an absolute truth, and uh, from what I can tell, everything you're saying is really resonating, because this is stuff that we've talked about for years and years and years, and I just didn't know that this was the same thing that Masonry talked about. Um, so it was a gnosis that I brought in from myself, from my raw consciousness consciousness element from from the, the 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 consciousness without any programs without any world programs anything like that just the pure consciousness brought out a lot of this information but then again if people are presented with this it's it, it's different if you're given the information versus if you're seeking the information is that the reason for a lot of the secrecy yeah i, th I think you're on to something there i mean i think that you know this is sort of you know, this is what we've talked about before. I mean, I think you're definitely onto something where masonry, you have to solicit membership. You have to want the information. You know, if you try to present this information to somebody who's not interested, you're just wasting your time. Um, and it's the same thing with masonry. If you're, if you're talking someone into joining who's not really interested, you're pretty much wasting your time with it. Um, and I think that to be the case. Um you know, you know, I believe the material, the information is very important. Um, and I, you know, I'm interested in studying it, but I'll be the first to admit that not everybody may be. Uh, and if you're not interested, you know, then it's not for you. I mean, I can't dictate to somebody how to live their lives or what to do or what not to do. Um, and I, that's one of the things I like about masonry. It's, 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 it's there, um, but you have to solicit it. It's, it's now, I mean, of course, do, you know, brothers, you know, who have friends trying to talk people. And of course, I mean, but you, you're, you're strictly not supposed to solicit members, but of course, you know, someone, you know, has a nephew or someone they want to get in and, you know, they do it, but technically you're not so, supposed to solicit members. And I think that's a good idea because, um, you know, you know, the person should want to seek it out. It should be in their heart. Um, I think I mentioned even this the last time I was on here was, you know, you'll, you'll inevitably see someone who gets talked into joining a lodge because he's friends with someone and he really doesn't want to be there, doesn't really have the interest. And he'll come up to the lodge and he'll go through maybe one or two rituals and then you'll never see him again. Uh, you know, it, it's just not for him. You know, masonry should be joining a Masonic lodge should be in your heart. The, the, the desire for this information, for, the, for this knowledge should be within you. And it's not for everybody. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not going to judge somebody if they're not interested. It's, you know, it's everybody's different, I suppose. That's what makes the world well, go round. Let me throw so, out, let me throw out so, this possibility then. What if the conspiracy theories about masonry are there for a purpose, maybe even designed by the masons themselves? And the reason for this is if you can see beyond the veil, if you're really seeking the truth, you're going to find it. Then the door opens for you. But you have to have the will to seek the truth first and foremost. Yeah, I mean, I, I never I never I don't know about that because the conspiracy stuff never really bothered me. Um, and it, <laughs> it, 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 the conspiracy stuff is really has really become more in vogue because of the uh, Internet. I mean, when when I when I joined the Masonic Lodge in 1996 or when I petitioned it and joined in late 96, you know, early 97, there was no Internet. 
I mean, I'd always heard this stuff, you know, about this, but I never really paid much attention to it. It really wasn't until I became a Mason and became much more heavily involved with it that you learn about it. And I mean, some of the conspiracy stuff is true. I mean, there was a Masonic cabal pulling the strings of the government in the very early days of the country. Um, there was, you know, um, you know, the influence of masonry when it came to the architecture and the construct of the country. I mean, this this is all true. Um, so, I mean, there there is some truth, you know, to this. Um, but I don't know if it, you know, I don't think that you know it was put out by the Masons per se. I mean, masonry took a massive hit in the 19th century um, because of all this. Uh, and, you know, almost went out of business. But it survived, and um, like I said, I just think that um, a person should join because it's in their heart, or not. If and it were alternatively, not join if it's in their heart. Um, I, I'm, I've always been interested in it. Like I, I know I've mentioned this on other shows, on you know, on your broadcast. I come from a long line of Maryland Masons. The conspiracy stuff didn't really deter me. I was just interested in you know the the, the teachings of it, and you know, I know for a fact that you know, how shall I say? Um, the teachings of Freemasonry, for me, it was consciousness expansion, doing the research. And I wouldn't have written the books that I've written if it wasn't for my Masonic membership. So for me, it was definitely beneficial. And uh, like I said, though, it's it's something that should be within you. You know, you probably shouldn't let so if someone's talking you into joining, probably not for you. Yeah, it absolutely has to be individualized. And, I, you know, I want to bring up a question that somebody brought up at the, be- at the beginning of our interview with you. And sure. it, let me see, it says, um, I tend to agree with you. No, Nobody was saying misogyny. I just found it odd that for an esoteric order, gender separation and secrets between partners would be a toxic thing. I get that, but we are now at a time to go beyond the veil of such low-level paradigms. It seems a long road ahead. Yep, balance and discernment is key. I I think that people don't really realize that these are not secret societies. These are societies of secrets, and they're secrets that are not about what people think of when they think of secret societies. It's not political intrigue. It's not um, it's not worldwide scams that are being run. It is it is a genuine attempt to keep information alive from ancient ancient times that is meant to um, elevate the human consciousness to a higher order. And the ones that are willing to seek that out are going to get it because they're able to to keep this information safe through generation after generation after generation of torment from religious structures, from political structures, and from all these other groups that have tried to take them down over and over and over again and those are the ai you know that's the ai attacking the human consciousness trying to get rid of the ancient knowledge because that's what that's what we tap into in order to bring about that evolution of our consciousness what do you think (laughs) what do you think robert let me ask robert i I agree i agree i think you said it i think you just said it very well i don't think I, i could say it any better i mean i think that you are dealing with secret wisdom i think you know, you know, when you get into Mason, what you're going to find, though, is what's what's interesting is it's it's really up to the even when you join, it's up to you to then continue on with this. A lot of Masons up in, in the lodge don't even know, understand the ritual. I mean, it's just verbatim. They're just going through it and they don't understand the deeper meaning. And Masonry, you know, and you read the work of Albert Pike, and this is what he talks about when he says, you know, this stuff is there. You know, this, this is always one of the things you'll hear in the conspiracy world. The stuff is there to mislead you and the symbols are there. Well, what he's actually saying is there's deeper meanings to what's even being presented to you within the lodge. Mm-hmm. And it's up for you to go on this path to, you know, basically what masonry does is it'll put you masonry will put you on the path. It's up to you to walk it. And, you know, some masons don't walk it. Um, even, you know, the masons in the lodge you know, may not be familiar with the esoteric teachings or, or the occult symbolism. It's up to the individual Mason, Mason to sit there and learn this for himself. And believe me, very few do it. I mean, you got to sit there and go through these voluminous texts written by people, you know, like Albert Mann, it can become very dry. Um, and uh, But if, if you take the time and it's spread out, you know, some of it's in this book and some of it's in that book. And again, that was one of my motivations for writing The Royal Arch of Enoch was to kind of combine you know, 20 books into one almost. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the information is there. Um, but even when you join the Masonic Lodge, 
you know, you may walk away from it thinking, oh, you know, I joined that. What's what's the big deal with all this? Even then, you got to go deeper, and and you know, you you read the works of Albert Pike and Mackey and Manly P. Hall. Then you'll start to be able to piece this together and understand the greater schemes of this. You know, the hermetic wisdom that this this the, the masonry and groups like it are are keeping, and it's there, but you gotta you gotta really dig deep to find it. You have to want it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I agree with that. That's what I have found throughout my entire journey. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this gnosis came from working um, with sacred plants from my Native American background in a, a shamanic sense. And one of the questions from Miguel um, earlier was, um, in masonry, is there any kind of... Um, it, it do, is there any kind of work with sacred plants, um, psychedelic experiences, et cetera, et cetera? I would say no, but... Um, What's your take, Robert? No, there. You're right. There's no. I mean, masonry, masonry doesn't, as an organization, promote any sort of political, you know, or religious or anything like that. Um, that would be what you're talking about now. That would be a decision for the individual Freemason. So, if the individual Freemason wanted to experiment with psychotropic drugs or anything like that. You know, I think you asked me this on on another show when I was on with you about Ars Goetia and, you know. Um, well, the, the Acacia Confucia, that's um, a psychedelic um, right. uh, um, uh, plant. And it's a very, very heavy content of DMT. And you've got the sprig of Acacia, for example. Right. You've got um, uh, the Acacia and Egyptian symbolism, uh, and, so on and so and forth. And you also got the fact that Dr. Rick Strassman's studies on DMT back in the late 90s was and early funded 2000s by the Scottish Rite. was funded solely by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Yeah. So, you know, it's yeah. interesting to me that Freemasons would be interested in psychedelics. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd have to look more into that. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with that, point. but I mean, the Sprig of Acacia is very, very important with um, in masonry as a symbol. Um, but, you know, I mean, and the Scottish Rite could have financed it because it's such an important symbol and wanted to know more about it, wanted to actually know about its, you know, hallucinogenic properties or its properties in general. That wouldn't surprise me because it is an important symbol within in masonry, albeit in the ritual, it's used for solar purposes. Um, but again, I, you know, like, like you know, I mean, I, I was asked, I think, like, you know, do Masons or the Masonic Lodge do Ars Goetia rituals or anything like that? I mean, the answer to that question is that's up to the individual Mason. Um, whatever the Mason gets up to on his own time, um, is is up is up to the mason whether you know if the, if the if the individual mason wants to practice rituals from Ars Goetia or something like that. I mean, you're not going to find that in a lodge setting. I can assure you, um, that would be an interesting sight to see. I have to confess, <laughs> but um, you know, I mean, I mean that th those type of things are up to the individual mason. You're not going to find that in a collective group of Freemasons in a Masonic lodge in a Masonic meeting. You know, on Masonic time after the meeting's over. over and the mason goes home and wants to pull out Ars Goetia and wants to try to summon a demon. That's up to him. Well, I would very true. I would refer listeners that are more in, that are interested in this aspect of Freemasonry to refer to the apprentice and companion rituals of Count Cagliostro's Egyptian rite. So, if you want to Google that, that'll take you to information about the alchemical operation related to the sprig of acacia awesome we've got yeah. another question and we've only we only have a few minutes Ooh, left yes we do. and i think you have a few questions too i don't think we're going to get i don't to think we're going to get to them all but so you go um, ahead. mr rs 2013 says what does freemasonry say about the false light that recycles souls and erases your memory we talk Ooh. about the artificial intelligence here and the theory that there is a kind of a soul sucking machine that brings you back into reincarnation is there any insight into, I, I guess, escaping the wheel of reincarnation? Or, I mean, d is that even talked about at all? No, in, in my knowledge, in my experience, nothing like that's talked about. Um, this would be a religious practice that so would be, again, left to the individual Freemason. Masonry teaches, um, you know, enlightenment, um, you know, belief in a supreme being. Um, how, you, how the Mason gets there is left to the individual Mason. So I would just leave it at that. Fair enough. Fair enough. Any questions you want to yes. get into, Shuri? Let me see real quick. Can you ask about aliens from David? Can you ask about aliens? Are there any uh, ET related Masonic teachings that you know of? Yes. Um, oh, I didn't expect that. <laughs> I didn't either. No. 
Well, there, well, there is, there is one, um, and it's, it, it actually does deal with extraterrestrial life. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to excise out right now into this just because of time. Anything relating to the Book of Enoch, the Royal Arch of oh, Enoch. Yeah, the Book of oh, there Enoch. you go. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to cut that out because um, that's too long a talking point. <laughs> uh, a, man, a man named. Um, this, this is a long story, and we want time for it, but to make a long story incredibly short, um, there's a very famous American Freemason named Thomas Smith Webb. Um, he's one of the premier Masonic ritualists in the United States. Everyone knows Malbert Pike. Uh, Smith Webb is much more influential than Pike is. Um, uh, Thomas Smith Webb is essentially the creator of the York Rite of Freemasonry. And in, in the late 1790s, he writes a treatise called The Illustrations of Masonry. And uh, actually, in this Illustrations of Masonry, he talks about extraterrestrial life. Um, he talks about, and this, this was something well known to the uh, founding fathers. This comes out of the works of a Dominican friar named Giordano Bruno. Um, they don't use the word extraterrestrial, but what Smith Webb actually talks about is he says, well, he said, you know, and this is coming out of the Enlightenment. He says um, out there, if you look into the universe, he says there's a polar polarity of worlds. Um, and they all fall under the aegis of the great architect of the universe. And what he's meaning is, he says, there's basically what he's saying in that it's another way of saying um, there's life on other planets and this life is under the protection of the Masonic great architect of the universe. So in this Masonic uh, treaties, in this Masonic monitor written by Thomas Smith Webb uh, called the Illustrations of Masonry, um, you will find this re reference to a plurality of worlds. Um, I can't remember the exact term he uses. He either uses infinity of worlds or plurality of worlds, uh, meaning there's life on other planets. It's a term coined by Giordano Bruno, who was a Dominican, a Dominican friar um, into the occult and into mysticism. So in that Masonic literature, you, you actually will find reference to extra, extraterrestrial life. Very interesting. I didn't. I didn't think that there would be. No, but I mean, it's that, right there. The Royal the, yeah, the, Arch of Enoch. Yeah, there you <laughs> Enoch go. Enoch, right there. Um, um, what was the purpose? I know this. We've got a few minutes left. Terry Wattini asked a personal question of you, Robert. What was the purpose, reason, or intention for you to become a Freemason? It was something I was always interested in as a, as a child. I was always interested in esoteric studies. I as a kid growing up. I was a big fan of the Leonard Nimoy In Search Of show, dealing with topics such as cryptozoology, Bigfoot, extraterrestrial conspiracies. Um, I, I was always interested in, in such topics. I come from a long line of Maryland Freemasons. My great-grandfather on my grandfather's side was a past master. My, gr my grandfather was a, a Freemason as well. Uh, past master is a person who ran the lodges of worshipful master for one year. Um, it skipped over my father. My father is not a Freemason, but in my family tree, there are a lot of Maryland Freemasons. And it was a, something I wanted to continue was something that just always interested me. And uh, when I got out of uh, Gettysburg College in 1995, um, I graduated Gettysburg College in 1995. Uh, this was a year before I went to law school. I went to law school in 1997. And um, I was afforded this opportunity in 1996. This was after I left Gettysburg before I went to law school. And uh, I, I may have mentioned this story before. I'll do it real quick. I know we're up against it. So a friend of my parents, he wore the Masonic ring. And I was uh, I, I saw it and I asked him, I said, hey, I see you're a Freemason. I want to I want to join. Uh, this is the perfect time for me. And he started the ball rolling, got me the application and I joined. And, uh, you know, carrying carrying on a family tradition. And it was something that always interested me. So uh, it, it fit hand in glove. Wonderful. And I think a final question, Alan Fry, is is masonry connected to admiralty law? Is row, Mason, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, is, merrily, merrily. Is merrily. Life is but a dream. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to go do some more investigative research into that. Um, there are connections to the American jurisprudence system to Freemasonry. One of the cultivators of the, of the American legal system was a Royal Arch Mason named Simon Greenleaf who is the founder of Harvard Law School. Um, so you will definitely find a Masonic nexus to the practice of law. Um, with admiralty law, I'd have to do some more research on that. I, I couldn't give you an answer sitting here uh, tonight on that. Fair enough. The line of thinking comes from the craft, of course, the watercraft, the boat, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, the different parts of the boat or the different degrees and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, Robert. I want to say thank you so much. 
uh, David and a couple of other people in the chat are saying, hey, you know, I think I want to join. I think I want to join. Um, I know that uh, the saying is to be one, ask one. Is there any advice for anybody that can't seek one out or doesn't have one in their vicinity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you want to join a, Masa- a lodge of Freemasons, my, my advice would be if you know one, that would be the proper way to go. Um, if you're friends with one, ask that person. If you do not know someone who is a Freemason, um, my advice would be then, and you want to join a, a lodge of Freemasons, the way to do it would be you, whatever state you are in, um, you go want to go on the internet and Google that state's Masonic Grand Lodge. So if you're in the state of New York, go to Google and type in Masonic Grand Lodge of New York or Massachusetts Grand Lodge, you know, Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, Grand Lodge of Virginia. Locate the Internet site for your state's Grand Lodge and then reach out to them. Uh, There's going to be a phone number there. Um, I I would recommend calling them, not um, emailing them. Uh, You'd probably want to talk to a a real person and just explain the situation. Just say, hey, you know, I'm I'm in your state. I'm, I'm here. Um, how do I go about joining a Masonic Lodge? I don't know any Freemasons. Um, what they should do for you is they will get your address and they will put you in contact with a, a lodge near your locality, near where you are, and set up a, a, a face-to-face or put you in contact with someone in that lodge or alternatively have someone from that lodge contact you to you know talk to you, find out why you want to join and get the ball rolling, um, You know, get you an application you can fill out. I think there's a fee to join. I, I don't know how much it is anymore. I think it was around a hundred bucks or so when I joined. I, I think I'm sure it's gone up. Um, and they should talk to you. Um, so if you're in a state, whatever state you're in, and you don't know any Freemasons, find that state's Grand Lodge website. Um, find a phone number on it, just even if it's a generic office phone number, and call it. Uh, call call it during business hours, and say introduce yourself and say. Hey, you know, uh, my name's so and so. I'm interested in lo- joining a lodge of Freemasons. I don't know any Masons though. Um, can you help me? Can you put me in contact with a local lodge? Um, and they should do it. Um, I've done this for other people, and uh, you know, I see no reason why why they wouldn't do it. So if 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 that be the case, that would be in my advice on on how to go about joining. Excellent. 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 Um, Robert, this has been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much for your time. Um, if you you can take a few more moments, uh, I know we're going a little bit over, but I'm keeping the stream going on Facebook, YouTube, and also for the archive recording. Um, we did bail out of iHeartRadio and TFR, um, but I did want to talk about um, some of the books that you have and the websites, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want me to stick around for like another five minutes or so? If you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I can. I can, okay. I can. I can stay around for about another five, ten minutes. That's about it, though. Okay, fantastic. So, um, yeah, tell us uh, just briefly about the Royal Arch, the cinema symbolism, anything you're working on uh, in the future. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Um, I have three books available right now, Royal Arch of Enoch, Cinema Symbolism and Cinema Symbolism 2. Um, the thesis of the, the, the thesis of the Royal Arch, I'll go in order. Uh, the Royal Arch of Enoch was my first book. Um, these the, the first two books were published in, like you said, at the beginning of the show in 2012 and the other in 2014. These books have all been republished by me. I found in my own publishing house in Baltimore. And um, these are all published by me. By me, my publishing house is called Deadwood Publishing. So if you see that, that's the copy you want to see. And again, these are all readily available online on all the major online internet sites. Um, Royal Arch of Enoch. The thesis of this book was um, one of the most important degrees of Freemasonry is the Royal Arch of Enoch. It's part of the high degree ceremonial system. It's the thirteenth degree in the Scottish Rite. It's the thirteenth degree in the York Rite. This degree comes out of Paris, France, as part of the original high degree body known as the Rite of Perfection. This is being cultivated in the 1740s, 1750s. The thesis of the Royal Arch book was that this ritual, as it was being developed, is incorporating, including components, elements of the lost Book of Enoch, One Enoch, Ethiopian Enoch, um, which shouldn't be happening. That book is off history, off the mainstream history pages till 1793, when a man named James Bruce brings back copies to Europe in 1793. They're not even translated into English until 1891. So the purpose of this book was to document this historical anomaly and also go into the symbolism philosophy of the Royal Arch of Enoch ritual, because it is this ritual that everything is being crafted around all the symbolism of the United States, all the symbolism in Washington, the Erie Canal, the Statue of Liberty, 
by and large, is all coming out of this high degree ceremonial. It is so critically important and is probably the most important degree in Freemasonry because it documents the recovery of the Tetragrammaton, also known as the name of God. Um, so it is it is arguably the most critical degree of Freemasonry, certainly in the high degree bodies. Uh, my second book was Cinema Symbolism. A uh, Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. And this book talked about hidden themes, symbols, icons um, going on in popular movies. So we talked in the first book, we talked about Gnosticism in the Matrix movies. Um, we talked about some of the I talked about some of the esoteric symbolism of the Exorcist, the Back to the Future trilogy, the Wizard of Oz, the Omen movies, uh, movies such as Black Swan. I got into the Ninth uh, Gate. In the oh, ninth yeah. That was my favorite, hands down. Yeah, this was something I actually talked about in the Royal Arch of Enoch book. Um, and then I published its sequel, Cinema Symbolism 2, where I've revisited The Ninth Gate. I got into some of the movies of David Lynch, Alan Moore, the Harry Potter uh, series, uh, the Spaghetti Westerns. Uh, I've revisited Black Swan again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in occult movie symbols and themes, check out Cinema Symbolism and Cinema Symbolism 2. If, if you're interested in esoteric masonry, Masonic history and its rituals and its symbolism, by all means, check out the Royal Arch of Enoch. I believe that book will condense about 20 books for you. And it's the first book out there that presented this historical anomaly, how this Masonic ritual is incorporating elements of the Book of Enoch. Um, so, yeah, I mean, check out those three books right now. I am outlining Cinema Symbolism 3. I am working on another book on masonry. I am getting ready to publish my first book of fiction, which is called A Pact with the Devil. This was a book that came to me entirely in a dream when I was sleeping. I am really excited about this. It's very dark, um, has conspiratorial elements in it. It is erotica, has erotic elements in it. It takes place in modern times. It's about a, witch, a witch's coven living in England. Um, so this book will be out. This is fiction. Uh, I want to stress that again. Uh, it's called Pact with the Devil. It's not autobiographical. Uh, it's uh, going to be out in probably December. Um, and I've already actually started working on um, a sequel to this book. So I've got a lot going on here. And um, yeah, I mean, th those three books, Royal Arch of Enoch, Cinema Symbolism, Cinema Symbolism 2, those are out right now. Those are readily available. And, uh, you know, the uh, work of fiction, th that'll be out probably in December. So, you know, again, if you're interested, just go to my website, www.robertwsullivaniv.com, robertwsullivaniv.com, links to buy my books, um, information about me, information about upcoming radio shows. I'm going to be on podcasts, um, links to my social media. It's all right there. Very easy to navigate. Oh, links to buy the book. I'm sure I mentioned that www.robertwsullivaniv.com. Excellent. Um, people in the chat are loving it. And uh, somebody asked, can you get this guy back on to talk about the cinema symbolism, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, hey, we've, we've got an uh, archive right here yeah. on, on YouTube. Um, but, you know, we do need to have you on again in the very near yes. future to talk about this because there's a, a new level of gnosis, new perspectives, new every understandings. Yeah. And as you can tell, every show we do just gets deeper and deeper, deeper, deeper and deeper and, deeper and, and deeper. better and better and better. I think this was the best show we've ever done with you. And uh, maybe it just touched upon like the first level stuff, the, the masonry, and we didn't really get into the actual um, symbolism, but this created the perfect middle pillar. As the, the troll, it. It yes. as the trolls like to say, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was a great show. Thanks for having me on. And sure, I mean, in a couple months um, after Pact with the Devil comes out, I don't want to cannibalize your show, of course. But yeah, absolutely, <laughs> I'll come on. And um, yeah, I don't even think we've scratched the surface on some of the movie stuff. So um, I think we haven't maybe out past shows, but absolutely, we can do uh, cinema symbolism. Anything you want to talk about, and of course, any any Masonic questions you want to ask, no problem. Uh, always a favorite topic of mine. Excellent. Um, I will be calling you over the next couple of weeks um, for an off-air conversation, if that's okay. And Of course. Um, Just email me. We'll set it up. Okay. Fantastic. So um, thank you so much for your time, Robert. Have a great evening. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have Thanks for having me on. Have a good night. Take care. Thank you, Robert. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in. A uh, little extended version of the broadcast this evening. I wish we could keep Robert on a little bit longer, but... It, he is um, on the East Coast. He though. is on the East Coast, yes. Yeah, so late it's, there. what, one o'clock? It's one o'clock in the morning. There. One o'clock. And um, guys, thank you so much for the awesome questions. Yes. I mean, you know, you guys really made the show tonight. It rock. was it, all of the questions from the listeners mm -hmm. and... Um, yeah, check out Robert's books because he goes he goes in depth. And as you can tell, the guy is definitely on the level. 
and mm-hmm. um, he's he's a straight shooter. You know, there's no bullshit when yeah. it comes to Robert. He's just like, here's here's what I know, and mm-hmm. here's what I've researched, and here's the truth. And we we've talked about the bat side of masonry too. And uh, some people were bringing this up in the chat. You know, why are a lot of the presidents masons and so on and so forth? Mm-hmm. His answer in previous interviews were uh, that there's bad people who are masons, and mm-hmm. there's good people that are masons, but it's not indicative of the organization as a whole. Right. So um, I thought that was a very powerful um, statement because he did go into some of the 17, 1776 um, hijacking and overthrowing some governments and so on and so forth. And you would, you would think that's evil on the surface, but I started thinking to myself in hindsight, like, wait a minute. It's overthrowing governments really that evil? I if mean, when they get government? out of control, isn't it time for them to go in something else? It gets, yeah. you know, I mean, I'd like to see a, a time when we don't have governments at all. So mm-hmm. I can't really look at it and go, okay, well, maybe that was evil or good. I have to have right. the actual details as to what was going on. Right. And if you have a corrupt, tyrannical government, then, who knows? Yeah. Changes the dynamic there. Mm-hmm. It's so, not so black and white. Right, yeah. right, right. So, yeah, it's been an incredible journey, my fellow travelers, and um, yeah, amazing. Are there any more questions you feel that no, we should get to? Actually, into? no, that was it. I literally did all the questions that I was able to find. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, thank you so much, guys. It yes. was a great show, and it was because of you guys yes. and your questions. And once again, thank you to everybody that stepped up to the plate for Lucky, too. Yes, um, yes. Thank we're going to get her back on track. We're going to get her back. And yeah. everything will be awesome. Let us know if there's anybody that you would like us to interview and ask questions of. Yes. Yes. Yes, because... We run out of ideas. It's like, okay, we can uh-huh. talk about the raw consciousness stuff, but how long can we talk yeah, about that? Yeah, how long can we talk? And then there's like new perspectives and new ideas that come to the table, but then I don't want to be like a parrot, like, you right. know, just, just the same thing over and over and over right. and over again. And so we want to hear what you guys and gals want to hear about and yeah. who you want to hear. And From. you can always email yeah. us info at beyondtheveilmedia.com, info at beyondtheveilradio.com. I think they both go to the same place. Yeah. And um, we keep everything um, in mind. And we've received a ton, a ton of emails requesting the ayahuasca guide. And some people have shared their experiences. I, I've had to come to get to the point to where I'm sending out automated messages because there's just so there's many so coming many in. Yes. I wanted to do that personal touch, like reply yeah. to everyone. And I tried and I just, I couldn't. And yeah. people on Facebook have been writing and I haven't been able to get to those. Yeah. Ah, somebody said seven Bomar. Okay, yeah, Law yeah, Law seven. Stewart said seven Bomar. We'll so have seven back we'll, on. yeah, yeah, seven's a good friend of ours. So we yeah. will have um we'll have seven on in the next couple of weeks for sure. I just need to like get a hold of him. Once I can get a hold of him, then I'm like, hey, you need to come on. And he's like, oh yeah, no, I I've been waiting to come on forever. <laughs> we have the beautiful. It's just making that initial connection right. that's difficult. We have the beautiful singer Nikki Colombo coming on next Friday, the thirteenth. Ah so, yes. Yes, looking forward to that. And somebody said John Lamb Lash. We had John on a while back. Yeah. And um, mm. it wasn't a very. It, the, it wasn't very productive. Let's just let's just put it like this: the energies were not. They weren't. They weren't meshing very yeah, well. They were mixing. And um, yeah, that's nothing all, wrong with that's that. All, that's all I'll say on that. Yeah. But the energies weren't mixing well, so yeah. it's not. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's just you know that's yep. the way it is. Um. Yeah, Seven Bomar will definitely, I'll definitely write him on Monday and have him back on. Seven's not really much of a guest. He's more of a lecturer. <laughs> he's more of a, yeah, he's more he's of a more press of play. A, all right, we're going to put the full screen on the guest here, uh-huh, sit and just back, sit back and, and, and just relax for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and only take breaks, make him take breaks. To take breaks and right. then as oh soon no as he does the back. he does the breaks himself like oh yeah he that's ha- right he asked me okay give me the cl- the show clock beforehand yeah. and he's like all right and we'll get back into that right on the other side and we're we like uh, <laughs> did he just take over our show yes he did seven no awesome, we love man. him we love, we love him. you yeah long time so friend so yeah and I think he's I think he's stood in for us a few times um like whenever we were on our honeymoon or something like that. No, 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 no. Um, I think he was a guest. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, it's uh, he's a great guy. So we'll get him back on here in the next couple of weeks. And anybody else that, you know, you guys 
want to hear from, just let us know because we're always looking for new material and new, you know, new aspects and new ways of looking at things. So, yep, it's it's y'all show. It yeah, I mean, really, that's what it, it comes down to. You know, y'all show. Even the network. You know, oh, here people in, in YouTube. You people guys. in YouTube are, are writing, so we'll check out some of these names. Ah, oh, excellent. Um, yes, Tobias Pierre. Lars, Pierre Sabak, Mark is a legend. Oh, I think that's something else. So, um, awesome. All right, excellent. Yeah, Michael Tassarian, we've had him on. Uh, David Whitehead. Way back in the day. Yeah, David Whitehead. He used to do a show on our station. Yeah. David's a cool dude. Um, yeah, David's really, really Mark Passio. Mark Passio we is, haven't had Mark on in like six, six years, seven four years. years or five should, years. Yeah, we need to reach out to Mark. Yeah, we need, yeah. and we'll, um, we'll have him on again. Yeah, um, so we're putting all this. Thomas Sheridan. Um, I've heard the name. No, he was talking shit about us. Oh, yeah, that's right. I don't know, just for no reason. He just yeah. called us like oh, yeah, ops that, or something like that. Yeah. I think that was Thomas Sheridan. Yeah. Like the, we had him on, did a great show. And one person. He's like, oh, yeah, all those people at Truth Frequency. I'm like, the fuck we just asked you all the questions that we had here that you wanted us to ask you right dude. exactly <laughs> no. i don't know what we did <laughs> right yeah. um um so wayne bush are you writing these down i i am wayne bush um mark passio david whitehead are you writing it down? If I if I write You're it down, I have right. to make I have to make a lot of noise. Here, I'll, I'll... okay, thank you. There you go. Oh, we'll mute that. Og Telles, A U G T E L L E Z. Lada Leon. See, this is why I love you guys. I mean, y'all are just like here's here's twenty names. So cool, cool. We will do this. It's going too fast. Oh, Freeman. We haven't had Freeman on in a long time. We used to have him on pretty regularly, but then he's, he went to go do his own thing. Um, oh, Kavasilis. We just had George on just a couple weeks ago. It's in the archives, youtube.com slash beyond the veil. Um, we didn't quite have our video right on that show. It didn't look as, as nice as it does now, but it was one of the first video shows we did. So don't vape into the mic. Do not vape. Yes, do not vape into the mic, Mrs. Geo. <laughs> Um, and Jim Carrey, of course, man, that'd be awesome. I would love to have Jim Carrey on, but he's a little too high profile, I think, but we can always reach out to him. Like I talked to Woody Harrelson one time and he's like, yeah, man, I'd love to come on the show. And then his publicist was like, oh yeah, no, he's not going to be able to do that. And I'm like, it's going to be a badass show. Come on, just get out of the way and let us do our thing. Wes Penray. Wes Penray. Oh, Mark Sargent. I think we might be able to pull Mark on right now. Let's see if he's available. Talk a little flat earth. Mark. Mark Sargent. Oh, Mark Passio's online too. We'll have to shoot Mark. Here, I'm going to write him an email right now. Hey, Mark. How are you doing? Been a long time since we've had you on. Would love to schedule a time. Cheers. There you go. Mark Passio has been invited. We'll see what happens. But um, Mark Sargent is not on air. Usually we can pull him on last minute. Say, hey, Mark, come on. And he's like, hey, I got so much to talk about. And then they get in 30 minutes and we're just laying back and like, okay. Anyways, I think we're going to wrap it up because now now the broadcast is just getting silly. But thank you for um, – we had Joe Rogan on a while back. It's been years since yeah. we had him on. We had Dennis on a couple months ago. Maybe it's time to have Dennis on again. So we will do that. Um, and, yeah, Dennis is a good friend too. So – yeah, you can find the Dennis McKenna. You know what? The last Dennis McKenna show we did, mm -hmm. I never uploaded it. Because what happened at the end of the show is his audio started going out of sync with the video. So you can find that at tfrlive.com slash beyond the veil, but we never actually posted the video show. Oh. But you know what? We can probably post just the audio. 
mm -hmm. and that'll that'll be good yeah but um yeah we were having some some audio sync problems that night and then we had Edie Frexka on with the round table with Louis Luna and uh I don't I don't I, you know I don't think we ever posted that one either I think the recording crashed on that one so it took us a while to harness the video aspect of it because we've always been um, audio podcasters and now we're kind of turning to video which yeah uh, there was a little bit of a of a curve there a learning curve yeah. yep so so great show you guys very happy with it i'm reading the chat yeah i know me too you gonna have a lord lord stephen christ somebody said <clears throat> and he can come on with no shirt on and lay like this and eat uh -huh. eat fruits so, yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. <sighs> Anyways, <laughs> all right. I think it's time to wrap it yeah, up. Yeah, it's starting to get really silly now. So, kiss the one you love right now. You never know the last time is going to be. And um, subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube.com/slash Beyond the Veil. We'll be doing just kind of spur of the moment broadcasts. We're always here Friday and Saturdays for the most part, seven o'clock to ten o'clock Pacific. And um, we'll have much more for you coming up throughout the week. So keep your thumb to the sky. Don't forget to bring your towel. And that's the way the news goes. Love you guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you for traveling with us this evening. Meditate on your experience. And remember, reality is merely an illusion. Thus, we wish you.